but it also means that he would repeat things because it's ten percent recap. Yeah, yeah, it's ten percent uh, last time yeah, in Charles right. Dickens, <laughs> like um, on MasterChef. Yeah, right. <laughs> You've so, just joined us. And I'm Ben McKenzie. Welcome to Pratt Chat, a monthly Terry Pratchett book club podcast. Each month we discuss one of Terry Pratchett's books with a special guest. This month we are discussing Dodger, which is one of Terry Pratchett's most garbage non-discord books, but in a good way. And our guest is crypto cruciverbalist David D.A. Astle. Welcome, David. Hi, Ben. Elizabeth. How are you? I'm really well, actually. It's on a very wet day. That's true. A very tosher day unfriendly day <laughs> that's true although as he keeps pointing out it does clean out the sewers when it rains this is the world of toshes that we're going to be talking about and looking forward to it this is your first ever terry pratchett it is surprisingly for for many because i know he's the the master of wordplay but my first plunge into the world of pratchett but what's the noun what's the a, a lover of terry pratchett is it a Oh, a Terry so, file or a Pratchett. Yeah, there's Hoovians for like yeah. two, but like, You know what? There was a word that we used to use on the internet. Is um, it Pratt's? <laughs> not no, the Pratt's. No, Pratchett is. I, I don't. Oh, that's a good question. I mm. don't know. If you know, listeners, please let us know. <laughs> yeah, we need to know that word. We need to know. <laughs> yeah, I was quite surprised that you hadn't read him before. Like, Was there anything that held you back, do you think? Or is this sort of one of those things that you mean to read and it's just sort of... I think it's because he is the master of wordplay and there's no question that he is. He has such a great ear for language and for double entendre and gags and illusions. But sometimes if you love licorice because you make licorice, then you don't necessarily have licorice uh, on your diet. That mm. is, I spend most of my time turning words inside out for a job, particularly as a crossword maker, mm. and Terry does it as a storyteller. So I suppose it just, for a break, I often turn to readers who are a little more sparse or more uh, narrative focused rather than the texture of language. Hmm. Mm. I can relate to that. When I was writing science comedy for a long time, I refused to read uh, Bill Bryson's The Theory of Everything. Or, um, um, oh, it was A Brief History of Everything. That's it, yeah. Yeah, and I, I didn't want to read it because I thought, what if I've written, what if he's written the same <laughs> joke I've written? Then I won't be able to use it. That's right. Uh, we're here to discuss a completely different book uh, by Terry Pratchett. And our first non-Discworld book for the podcast. Hey. Uh, I mean, I think we've had a pretty good run. We're up to episode six and we still still haven't done any non-Discworld books. But as we've been discussing, we're going to have to step up the non-Discworld quotient because he wrote about 71 books and only 41 of them are Discworld books. Only 41. <laughs> I know. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> so, I mean, look, I'm <laughs> glad he wrote so many books, but we're going to be doing this forever, <laughs> which is good. What a, what a pleasant thing to do forever. And uh, also as an exciting side point, this is the first time that all three of us on the podcast have been reading a book for the first time because I'd never read Dodger previously. Yeah, nor me. So. There you go. So there's still it's still very fresh as an experience. Yeah, very exciting. We like to start off our discussion of the book by reading the blurb, so um, I will take that away. Dodger is a tosher, a sewer scavenger living in the squalor of Dickensian London. Everyone who is nobody knows him. Anyone who is anybody doesn't. He used to know his future... It involves a lot of brick-lined tunnels and plenty of filth. But when he rescues a young girl from a beating, things start to get really messy. Now everyone who is anyone wants to get their hands on Dodger. It's pretty, that's a pretty good blurb, actually, I've got to say. And it's a blurb that I did not read, because I, I just saw the book in a shop when it first came out, went, oh, it's Terry Pratchett, I'll just buy it, thinking that he's introducing a Oliver Twist-type character into the Discworld. I opened the first page, I went, oh, this isn't what I expected, and put it away until now. So We've all got slightly different editions of the book. I ordered mine, a second-hand copy, but it's a later printing, and I'm quite sad, because now it's the first Terry Pratchett book I own that was printed after his death. But, but it is a great book. I, I really liked it. And it starts off with a bang, almost literally. And a slosh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, as you said in, that, uh, in the blurb, it's that gothic, uh, dramatic opening with you know, everything but the big organ chords 
you know, which which you just hear as you're reading the prose. You are imagining them because you can see that horse, the cart, like driving through the rain and the rain pelting down. It's very like we've all seen. I think Victorian London is one of those things that we've all seen some version of it in a film or on TV, uh, and it just comes so readily to mind. I, I confess at the start of this podcast, I have not read a lot of Dickens, but this is so Dickens. There's it is. It's a, it's almost um, you know trying to out Dickens Dickens. <laughs> There's a sentence um, describing uh, what's happening with the Thames, which I know you would have loved, Liz, because you're obsessed with... Well, the the rivers of Terry Pratchett. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Which is just lots and lots of little phrases with semicolons. And that's what the first two paragraphs of Oliver Twist are like. It's just full of all these short phrases with semicolons. You know, the debris of muck, slime and filth, the dead dogs, the dead rats, cats and worse bringing back up to the world of men all those things that they thought they had left behind them, jostling and gurgling and hurrying towards the overflowing and always hospitable River Thames, bursting its banks, bubbling and churning like some nameless soup boiling in a dreadful cauldron, the river itself gasping like a dying fish. That's all one sentence with semicolons. And it's also it's... just beautiful language to describe something real gross. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. like it's real gross. London is disgusting at this time. And that really comes through in all of the, all of the descriptions of it. Because you can easily romanticize it because everyone's wearing like the old timey clothes and stuff, or just as it were at the time, clothes. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, um, but yeah, it's just you can feel the grime coming off the pages in every description. And I think that's great. Also, horrible. Like, I think I showered more while reading this book than <laughs> any of the others. But um, yeah, I mean, that's testament to good writing if you can make your readers feel like they've been befouled by your pages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. True. Uh, uh, it's almost like the uh, the sentence itself is littered with semicolons, like uh, they're just glutted floating down the Thames as well as the, uh, all those uh, all those words. Oh, what a great image! Now I'm imagining that in the sewers, just semicolons, <laughs> semicolons and, everywhere. Yeah, probably like an interrobang. You know. <laughs> yeah, how much would you get for that down at the pub? Do you reckon? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, a few bob. Yeah. Be worth a pint, wouldn't it? You got uh, a yeah. square bracket, like that's quite rare. <laughs> Psst. You want a pilk row? <laughs> oh. Wow. oh. I knew you'd pull out some obscure one I'd never heard of. That was very good. Which one's a pilkrow? What's that? Uh, that's the paragraph mark. So it's the fat P with the two stalks. Ah, oh, mm. I never knew what that mm, was called. Pilkrow. Yeah, it's a good I one, mean, I've it? seen it a lot. Yeah. Know? But this is that opening scene. And as you say, it is it is rescuing someone mm. from a desperate situation because this coach screams around the end and it does really does scream. It's an important plot point. There's something gone wrong with one of the wheels that makes a horrible screeching noise. And this young woman falls out or is thrown out of the carriage it's going too fast for it to stop so these two bucks jump off and they're trying to manhandle her and that's when our hero arrives bursting up out of the sewers <laughs> which is not where you expect heroes to come from unless it's the teenage mutant ninja turtles but that's right here comes Raphael to yeah. rescue <laughs> um and his first line in the book is you let that girl alone there's no ambiguity about who the hero of this book is it's true it's it's Camelot-esque he's identified as being a noble and uh, gallant soul, and despite his um, place of residence or seemingly seeming place of residence, mm. certainly not seemly, <laughs> uh, and also that um, when we know a little more about him and the murky way that he survives in London, uh, we are always foregrounded by the fact that he is a noble and um, courageous person. Which is kind of mirrored by like his cleanliness throughout the book. I'm sorry to just keep harping on about mm. cleanliness in this book, but he literally bursts out of a sewer initially, and by the end of the book, he's like at Savile Row getting dressed in a suit. Mm. So he after the Turkish bath. Yes, exactly. He couldn't be more clean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he is unusually clean for a Tosha, as we'll discover. But right now, he's he's not very clean. But it's um, metaphorical. His tr- like transformation. It's, oh yeah, yeah. It's, yeah true. it's interesting actually. Think mm. about sort of hygiene as he's becoming. Mm. Um, and like I, next to godliness or like mm. the same as godliness as some characters seem to think. Yeah. So. Uh, I quite like in this first bit too that, you know, he is he is a younger, smaller, spry man fighting off two bigger, uglier, presumably uh, brutish men. Um, and they don't just expect us to believe that he's got like magic martial arts skills. He's wearing a pair of brass knuckles and he's in the rain and he surprised them. So, and he's just really fast. And you get, it, it, I think Pratchett did a good job of selling that that would actually happen. Well, because proper effective fighting isn't like very nice to look at. No. It's not elegant. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, right. It's brutal and awful. He uh, sort of tries to help the girl, although he's off, he's busy, he runs off like chasing off these two ruffians to make sure they don't come back. And meanwhile, two other very important protagonists show up to find this girl lying Mm. helpless in the gutter. It's just like an Enid Blyton book, everyone's wandering around in pairs, like it's... (laughs) 
That's true. And converging. Yes. Yeah. I mean, look, coincidence is rich in this book, given all the luminaries that uh, Dodge's path crosses. But uh, there's mm. no getting around the reputation of both these two men, Charlie and Henry, who suddenly appear. Because mm. mm. it is uh, no other than Charlie Dickens and um, Henry Mayhew, who is the book is dedicated to him. Um, mm. as the author of a very important book called London Labour and the London Poor, uh, which we will talk about more, I, I'm sure, as we go through the book. But uh, he, he and Charlie show up and try to help this young lady and then Dodger comes back and they don't know he's honourable. There's a bit of a... Uh, yeah, everyone bungee. thinks everyone's not honourable. <clears throat> yeah, which, I mean, look, when you're in the rain and someone is, like, helpless on the floor... You don't really take chances, do you? You don't. No. And the presumption, particularly given his dress and uh, the reputation of his class, mm. then the fal- you know sort of false uh, presumptions are made. Um, but I mean, I was gr- very grateful to um, Pratchett for this book alone in introducing me to Mayhew because he certainly was a uh, a champion of um, of the underclass, and we can talk about him as you say in due course. But uh, I think it's. A very worthy um, dedication for the book, but also I love the fact that a book like this opened my eyes to other aspects of London life that I didn't know. Mm. Uh, so there was the the side trips and the tangents that this book um, encouraged you to take. Yeah, it's clearly something Pratchett must be very passionate. Uh, who, pa- passionate? He was very <laughs> passionate <laughs> about. Maybe that's it. Maybe people who love Pratchett are, are, are passionate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like the Prashnets. I'm, I'm into it. I like it. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, he's something that Terry Bradshaw was clearly very passionate about. And he, he likes a lot of that sort of yoldy timey stuff. I remember seeing there was a, a series of photographic portraits taken of authors dressing up as their favourite literary characters from children's books. Mm-hmm. And he dressed up as just William. Yeah. Mm. So he was there as a schoolboy with his shorts on and he had like the slingshot uh-huh. and the hat. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was great. Um, and I think that really shows that this was his era. And in, in our last episode, we were talking about pyramids and he you know there's the first part of that book is very much john brown's assassin school days so i think those references those influences are very strong on him plus the research just um oozes out of oh yeah every passage in this yeah and he, he doesn't list any sources in in the novel but in the companion book which we will talk about at the end um dodger's guide to london there's a very long list of both original sources and online sources oh great um mm. that he clearly consulted not just for for the reference book, but also for the original work. So, probably yeah. while writing ten other books at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> what a, what a machine. But yeah, after the argy bargy, they mm. eventually convinced Dodger to let them take the girl to Henry Mayhew's house, where she'll be looked after. But he's allowed to come too to just sort of keep an eye on things, and that's kind of where we start the plot properly. Yeah, yeah. it's a real juxtaposition there where they're taking Dodger and this poor woman into what is not even really a very wealthy house. And they come back to this later in the book when he revisits the Mayhews. He say, you know, they're very well off compared to Atosha, but they're not terribly well off compared to, like, you know, the landed gentry or, you know, your proper knobs, to use the term yeah. from mm. the book. It's still such an alien world to us now. Like, they have three servants and you're like, they're not well off, but they have three people who do their cooking and cleaning for them. Well, like, they did have to get rid of their second maid because things were a bit tired. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's that's true. Yeah. Henry was giving too much away, too many arms. Mm. Well, the, but, of course, it was palatial to Tosha. Mm. Um, it was the Taj Mahal, even though it was probably, you know, Mayhew represented the middle class, affluent middle class. But to Tosha, it was, uh, you know, resplendent. So we keep accidentally calling him Tosha, which I think is a direct result of British slang being overrun with Tosh. Tosh is in rubbish. Tosh as in rubbish collectors, Tosh the character from the bill, and Tosh as in Macintosh, which the character always wore. They eventually leave her there, but I think the best bit of this section of the book is when Charlie Dickens sits Dodger down and really has a word to him, and that's when you really get Pratchett's version of what Charlie Dickens is like coming out, because he's very shrewd. He's very onto it, isn't he? You'd have to be, I guess, to write the things he wrote yeah. in the time he wrote them. Uh, also, too, that uh, Dickens, fascinatingly, was an insomniac and a, a devoted flaneur. He was one of the originals who would wander around London in the middle of the night and would write extensive diaries and notes. And this came out in his um, columns as well and uh, books that uh, talked about London life. So he was the eyes and ears of the city. Uh, and that conversation rang true, even as contrived as it was, it did ring true to Dickens' character. Yeah. He, he would have had to have been Arch and he would have had to have 
either a sixth sense or a direct contact with all those sorts of people and castes and classes that um, uh, manifest in his books. It's an interesting exchange too, I think, because often when you get this sort of meeting of the minds between two very different characters from different origins, one of them usually has the upper hand. But this is a real, it feels like a real meeting of equals because Charlie Dickens sees right through Dodger, but Dodger also sees that Charlie Dickens is seeing right through Mm. him and responds appropriately. Well, they both survive and flourish by reading people. That's their mm. that's their kind of common ground, isn't it? Yeah. And there is a lot of explanation throughout the book of what looks are saying. You know, Dodger says, I'm not a thief. And Charlie Dickens says, you mean you're not only a thief? And you're like, <laughs> yeah, that's what people mean when they say that, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and then there was, the man gave Dodger a cursory glance, which had quite a lot of curse in it. Oh, that is one of my favorite yeah. lines in the whole book. It's quite a, a leap to go from his early Discord novels to this, which is one of the, the last things that he wrote. It was written in 2012, so only a few years Um, before the end and he there's not nearly as many gag gags in it but it's so funny all the way there's lots of those little really funny turns of phrase and lovely bits of wordplay it's just yeah it's hilarious but there's not a lot of what you would call gags i suppose in it i'm also interested to know how this book stacks up against his earlier or even his um peak novels whether they be discworld or others because as Rich as the book is, I also thought there was a lot of repetition or a lot of upholstery that I wasn't enjoying about the book. There was a scene, many scenes, in fact, where whether it was the Savile Row scene that we've mentioned or whether it's eating porridge at the Mayhews, where the essence of the scene is clear and yet there's a lot of language that we need to chomp through, like Mrs Mayhew's porridge. (laughs) And I just didn't know whether that was Pratchett-esque or whether that was indicative of this book um, Mm. more than others. So that you say that it was a little light on gags, I I don't have the yardstick to measure. But I Mm. certainly would think it's it's rich to a point of being over-rich with with language at the expense of um, the narrative's velocity. I feel like sometimes when I have done a lot of research for something, it is hard to then write that thing simply Mm. or in a way that is as enjoyable as it would have been if I was using purely my imagination. And I feel like that is perhaps a handicap in writing a book like this where you have to include a lot of real world elements. So Mm. I did find it not as the word that you would have if you were like snapping your finger. Like it didn't run as quickly as a... as a Discworld book because real life gets in the way, I think. Yeah. So, And I also found interesting with the footnotes. The footnotes were mostly just footnotes, not jokes, whereas usually they are mm. purely there to amuse. Yeah, he's famously a writer of uh, lots of footnotes. Yeah, he is, and I, which I've come to love and I've been reading a lot about footnotes because many of my favourite writers do have footnotes fetish. Um, one of them <laughs> is Nicholson Baker. and But uh, with Terry, I found in this case they were quite – orthodox mm. and i i know that that's not his usual shtick mm. footnote section of my things the first note is more footnotey yeah that's the first thing I said. <laughs> they are more footnotey absolutely yeah, yeah they are yeah um i think well I, interestingly like i said i hadn't read a lot of dickens and i did go and read a few passages and, and a few chapters mm. for comparison and I, I think that must be a major influence because i found there's certain people who their style of writing becomes very infectious and I think Charles Dickens has such a distinct style, even more wordy than this. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's partly where that, that comes from, is he's emulating that style. Kind of like if you, um, if you watch too much of The West Wing um, or, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you get that cadence in your head. Yeah, you get yeah. the Sorkin, you yeah. know, clipped and you have to be walking down the hallway. Yeah, speaking. walking down the hallways and it's a lot of repetition and it's very, very yeah, fast. It's a good theory, he, actually. And I feel like... Dickens hmm. has a different but equally kind of infectious style. And I found when I was writing notes for myself hmm. about the book whilst reading it, um, I was writing and speaking and thinking <laughs> in that style where I would say things over and over again and yeah. in different, slightly different ways, adding a little bit each time. So I think that's uh, where that comes from. I'd, I would probably need to read more than one um, Pratchett book, particularly a Discworld book, to, to see the contrast that possibly Dodger exhibits and maybe it, it is this kind of meta tribute to Dickens himself mm. um, or a spoof of Dickens, take your, take your pick. Yeah, a little <laughs> of, that's, a, that's an interesting theory. A little yeah. of column A, a little of column yeah. B, I reckon. Um, but speaking of, uh, of, of spoofing Dickens, uh, he, he comes off pretty well, I think, in this book as he a does. character. Mm. He's very, I mean, there's a couple of times where he's a little bit too cheeky 
and a little bit pushy, I feel. And he's and he I mean he never gives Dodger the he gives Dodger the benefit of the doubt, but he never gives it to him easily. He's mm. always giving him a hard time. Despite all the evidence that is that he's you know, he's a good guy. So it's it's a he's a bit rough on old Dodger. But he also does set up the main thing where he basically six Dodger on the case mm. to find out what's happening with this girl, why has she been beaten up, and then he's sort of it's the set of a detective story mm. from there, and he's kind of like the one pulling the strings in the background who's not quite the police or the peelers, um, but mm. not quite on the streets either. So he, at the end of a, quite a back and forth, he sets Dodger on to the path of finding out what happened, and there's not very many clues other than a ring and a game of happy families. Yeah. And her accent. She has a slight uh, European accent, which is also a clue. So in a way, Dickens is the partial architect of the book mm. and he's ubiquitous as Dodger. The two always seem to converge as if by magic at various points through the book. Yeah, that's true. They're always meeting up even mm. when they don't plan to. Um, but I think there's, it, even through this first part of the book where we're really sort of just laying the foundations, there's lots of good words and, and uh, bits of little tidbits about how Victorian London works. Um, this is where we saw a word that you were very happy to see. Fizzog. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was very excited to see the word fizzog because it's um, one that was there all through my childhood. Yeah. yeah. And I've never seen it written down. And I can't remember if it was with an F or a PH because I'd always just sort of had it there and never yeah. needed to write it down because when are you going to get to use it? Yeah. Now. <laughs> yeah. well, we, always, we always used to say, yeah, and it reminded me that so much Australian slang comes from this era of like Cockney rhyming slang and street slang because, you know, obviously European language in Australia is founded by a lot of uh, convicts. It's probably worth mentioning that physog means face. Oh, yeah, just um, in case you're in confused. Case anyone hasn't heard of it before. It's not that small yeah, furry. Yeah, um, is puckering up and looking a little bit quizzical. <laughs> yeah, it's not that small furry uh, dog-like creature from um, the Dark Crystal. And it's not a terrible mispronunciation of that really nice whiskey, which is actually Lafroy. Oh, yes, <laughs> very true. It could have been any of those things. Luckily, it is no. It is someone's yeah, face. Of a double fizzog knee. <laughs> but we, and it's also not long after this when uh, Tosha goes back down into the sewers after spending the night on the night like, sleeping on the floor of um, this girl's room, um, befriending the cook who um, makes yeah. a big show of showing that he's not stolen anything. And, yeah. yeah. Um, whereas the uh, the housemaid hates him on sight. So yeah. there's there's a nice bit of rivalry there going on. Uh, but yeah, he goes back down into the sewers where he feels at home and uh, has a very sad encounter with... Um, granddad. With Granddad. Like, it's not clear when you first meet him that he's not someone's granddad, but he's just called Granddad because he's the oldest surviving Tosha. And you find out, I think he's about 33. Yeah. But he's had a, a mishap during the storm. He's been crushed under a bunch of debris and is clearly about to expire. And Dodger goes off to buy him his final tot of brandy. Really bad, Brandon. He wants the bad stuff. <laughs> yeah, the, the cheapest possible yeah, the fizzog. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the love, the love fizzog. Yeah, that rot gut fizzog. So granddad's not well and Brandy does the trick. He, do, he does. He goes off having swearing that he's seen the lady of the sewers, which is the closest thing they have to an angel or God mm. among the Toshes. I was very sad. I was very sad for granddad. Um, and he gives his last haul. Of um, Tosh, we should. If we even said what Toshing is, we should say that because it's very important to the plot. Because yeah, and they also unfold that because I had decided not to look it up to see if the book would tell me what it is, and it did. It delivered in droves, kind of like how the industry is. Like so, basically, Toshing is hanging around in the sewers, waiting f- to see if valuables appear between the cracks and things have been washed away. So mm. what's been thrown away by above gets picked up by them below and is quite, again, metaphorical for the people who do the toshing. Yeah. It made yeah. me think of the Wombles, actually, because they're, <laughs> yes. they're underground and they're making good use of the things um, that other people Discarded. throw away. Yeah, that's right. Dodger's a very good one because he has all the haunts he knows to look at. Mm-hmm. He can kind of tell by the way the water's moving, where there's a little crevasse where things might have collected but there's a big rule where you don't go down the sewers when it is a storm and granddad has broken that and dodger is so good at toshing that as granddad expires um he was considered king of the toshes and he passes that title on to dodger Mm. Mm. you are now king of the toshes which is really sad it's kind of a curse yeah i so desperately wanted to find parallels to oliver twist through this book i was like is he fagin is he he's not and then when we get introduced to Solomon, who comes up in the next scene, I was like, is he Fagin? He's not. No, there isn't really a Fagin in this book. He he goes close. 
Um, yeah. There are there's certainly echoes there, but uh, he's a much more sympathetic character. <laughs> yeah, he is, isn't he? Well, yeah. Fagin's quite a caricature, and he's described with his hook nose and stuff. And mm. I feel like Solomon is kind of a nice counterpoint to the character of Fagin, which is probably yeah. not intentional, but uh, I think it'd be intentional. He's much more well rounded. Yeah. Like he's got a whole history, a backstory, uh, and this is Solomon Cohen, who is the um, <laughs> which is a nice little nod to Cohen the Barbarian who's uh, so good at barbe- being a barbarian, he's still alive and barbarian even though he's in his 80s. <laughs> um, but he writes a lot of self-help books and like to teach people how to be barbarians, that kind of thing. Yeah, he's great. So that was <laughs> a nice little Discworld, Discworld was, touch. Note to self. After seeing off Grandad, he heads off home, Dodger, which is where he lives, which is with Solomon Cohen, who, as we find out through the book, we get little glimpses of his history. He, was, he fled from um, the pogroms in Russia uh, through most of Europe. He'd been to Japan. He's been all over the world and ended up in London making little bits of jewellery and fixing little trinkets and things. And as you pointed out earlier, we don't really guess that he's got a home. Like, it's very easy to believe he sleeps in the gutter. Mm. Um, So it's a surprise when he goes back to this quite nice, for what you'd expect, place where he has a home with... uh, older gentleman who looks after him. Yeah. Yeah, which is also disarming because you are falling for the twist, twist. Um, But the (laughs) twist is that it's not Fagan and he's not Oliver, Mm. that he is a compassionate uh, foster father, really. Mm. It also introduced me to some lovely slang. The kids who'd go around stealing jewellery, I've discovered, uh, toy getters. (laughs) Later in the book, without giving too much away, Solomon acts as a fence and in... Um, Dickensian slang, that's a that's a Janus mug, oh. which is the two-faced mug that you need to be as a fence because you're encouraging the malfeasance of stealing, but then you turn around as this honourable businessman. And I thought, mm. well, that's perfect for Solomon, who he is. He is that person who lives between the two worlds. Yeah, although he doesn't like being a fence. No. Um, and he tried to get Dodger out of the habit of stealing things. He's a very positive influence on <laughs> yeah, Dodger in is, lots of ways. I mean, he makes him wash himself and be clean, cooks for him, makes sure he eats well, and, yeah, he dissuades him from doing the more directly harmful, illegal things that he used to do. Because as we learned throughout Dodger's backstory, he's done a lot of jobs before he ended up being a tosher, including being a snakesman, a small child who's who's nevertheless a master thief, but can get into places where larger people would not be able to get mm. into. Um, so yeah, it's, I, the relationship between the two of them is really interesting. I really redemptive. enjoyed it. It is a redemptive relationship. But he was already on the path because they have this relationship because Dodger saved someone from being beaten up very horribly. Mm. When he was in a bad mood, he said he could have gone either way. He could have chosen to join in the beating, but he chose instead to save him, which is, again, a crossroads. Once he's gone back to see Solomon uh, and Solomon's dog, Onan, who um, is a very important character in his own way, and also Onan's smell. There's a nice little... He's, Onan's a bit like a mixture of two Discworld characters, um, Gaspo the Wonder Dog, mm. but then there's Foul Ol' Ron, <laughs> who is the greatest beggar in all of Ankh Morpork. And I feel like Onan is kind of like a little bit of a combination of the two characters. Yeah. This is uh, where Dodger starts to make his investigations, starts mm. asking around, looking for information about what might have happened uh, or where this coach that... Um, you know, the girls fallen out of might have come from. And this is where I got a bit irritated because um, I don't want to come across as someone who hates love, but I found his immediate falling in love with the girl and that being one of his big motivators off-putting. Mm. Like I can see that's not something that's come up before in Pratchett. I just, I'm just, I'm tired of that as a trope and I didn't really believe it. I felt it, you know, and I, I didn't feel like it grew sort of immediately. I also felt like it sort of, It did kind of gradually come in, but it came in quite quickly about halfway through. Like at the start, he's sort of like, this is the right thing to do. And then, but but then about by halfway through the book, he's like, and also I think she's amazing, which, you know, as it turns out, she is, she's, you know, she might be fine. She's, she's fine. I mean, she's a, she's a Pratchett style damsel in distress, which means like she will save the day at a very key moment herself. But yeah, I agree. Because she doesn't really have a lot of agency or doesn't get to do much in her own story. Well, they hardly meet. Yeah. You know, they mm. only have these very brief encounters and often heavily chaperoned as it is. So it did feel as though it was, um, you know, a conceit of the book, um, mm. to be kind. There's, um, I mean, look, and there's a bit of an acknowledgement of that towards the end, but it, it is a bit hand wavy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would have liked for the character more to just do it because of all the noble things we're seeing about him anyway. Like, he has an idea of what is good and the right thing to do, and he is sort of on a redemptive path. He didn't need the extra push of liking this girl to make him do it. So Yeah, it could awaken later in the book, yeah. at least. I mean, there's no 
question that they are kindred spirits, as we discover. Mm. But let Dodger discover that. Yeah, it feels right at the end, but it doesn't feel like we get there via a very natural path. Mm-hmm. And, and that is something that we've said about some of the other love stories that like have appeared Yeah, in some of his earlier books particularly. I think I think as we get towards his later Discworld ones, it gets better. But this feels a bit like going back to those roots, doesn't it? Yeah. But we should probably mention the the key points about this character was that when she's been badly beaten this time, but it looks like she's been beaten before, Mm. so this is not the first time, she was pregnant but lost the child in the most recent beating. Yeah. And she mentions having a husband, though she doesn't mention who this is, where he is, or if he's the one doing the beating, which is implied, but that's a big part of the mystery as well. And these are big themes for what is touted as a young adult book. It's full on. It is full on. Yeah. But very important to have those themes in books for young adults because it's not like, you know, they're mm-hmm. not going to come up in people's lives. I, yeah, I thought that it handled the themes, those themes really well. Yeah, agreed. While still to sticking to that kind of essential Dickensian um, sensibility. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he starts asking around uh, to in see his if anybody nice knows anything. Yes, because he goes to a, a shonky shop <laughs> to get a shonky suit, which is how they consistently refer to it. <laughs> That's a, originally a derogatory term of um, Jewish people. Yeah, it's anti-Semitic. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We were talking mm. about this. Where, well, so, where does it come from then? Uh, sh- a shonika, which is a Yiddish word, means to bargain or to peddle. Um, oh, so, wow. if you're being given something from a shonika, then it's possibly shonky. In the same way, schmooze is um, comes from patter, you know, the Yiddish word. So, a schmoozer is again, it's a reference to the likes of Solomon Cohen. Yeah. Oh, well, they do. And they do use um, the word schmutter in the mm, book as mm-hmm. well to refer to like clothing. That's like your sort of fancy clothes. That's right. Put on. Yeah. What is it about shh that implies oh. not, not quite good? Yeah. Oh. oh, no, there's some. I mean, shtick is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good shtick. Schnaps. <laughs> schnaps. We love schnaps. Good shtick. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. He starts asking these questions in his suit and he does. He, he gets out the suit because he's like, well, I'm going to go back and visit. The, yeah. the Mayhews and, and this girl again and I Solomon look a bit more respectable suggests it I mm, think which is a good idea yeah he goes around to the pub is that yeah and he starts talking to people that he knows yeah. who ain't seen nothing ain't heard nothing wasn't mm. even there yeah, yeah which just reminds me of Bart Simpson <laughs> like that was his that was his tagline when he first started up in the early 90s um, or late late 80s well um, also he gets what he deserves, does Dodger, because one of his uh, mantras, one of his credos is never tell nobody nothing they don't need to know. Mm. Uh, yeah. Because, in fact, he is a pathological liar, particularly when he comes to peelers. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, or omitter, you know. Re- but uh, so it's, he has to use his cunning, really, to get information. And his coin. And his coin. Well, he asks about the squeaky yeah. wheel, doesn't he? Did someone else say that they heard it at that stage? Yeah, I it was a remember. girl. That's right, yeah. But now everyone knows he's asking questions, and that is a big risk for him because like you were saying that's the creator of the streets don't say anything Mm -hmm. but he's asking people to say something and that's a big like step outside the comfort zone for all concerned but she um he's progressively more the more money he gives her yeah that's right but then he goes back to visit the the mayhews again mayhew takes some more notes um which for what we eventually find out is his book he goes to see Charlie Dickens to tell him what he's found out. And he accidentally becomes a hero by stopping a horrible, horrible, vicious armed robbery as it later becomes, but it was actually a very mild attempt at a mugging by a nervous drunk man that he actually knows. <laughs> yeah. And he ends up just sort of ushering out and giving some coins that he will go to sleep. But through the magic of words, which is a big theme of the book and casting a fog on what actually happens, it gets twisted into he's a big hero who like stops all the bandits from tearing up the newsroom. And that sort of sets a theme for the next few days of yeah. luck and also the story as opposed to the truth. Uh, yeah, that's right, owning the narrative, which is something that Charlie Dickens helps Dodger realise yeah. because um, that theme of heroism actually waxes through the book, and particularly with uh, Charlie at the helm and writing largely and gloriously of Dodger's exploits. Mm. Yeah. You were saying before that the coincidence looms very heavily in this book. And, Mm -hmm. you know, usually you have that inciting incident at the start of a story where there is like someone just happens to be in the right place at the right time and that sets them on a path. And Dodger just is consistently in the right place or the wrong place at the wrong time. When the first one happened, I was a bit like, really? But then when the third one happened, I was like, oh, I guess that's what this book is about. I'm actually fine with this now. And there's parallels throughout um, 
all of these heroic incidents where people want to see things as black and white. There's the villain and there's the hero, whereas in all of the cases, the villain is also a victim in some ways. So mm. the man who's holding up has lost a leg from being in one of the Napoleonic Wars. And is super drunk as well. Yeah, yeah. and they do actually touch on PTSD throughout the book in the fallout of war um, quite subtly in some places more overt in one scene but it is actually a running theme throughout about what war did to all these people and how that's impacted their life Mm. yeah the more i read about pratchett the man the the more that humanitarian quality in him and the humanism quality in him is very evident in in dodger yeah, and that's a big theme of a lot of his books. Mm. Um, but yeah, so he saves saves them, in inverted commas, from um, this horrible murderer and thief who... Is just, just on a, his way back from having a slash down the alley, isn't he? Yeah, he basically. Well. He's like, oh, I see an opportunity. But just yeah. wander in through the door with my bread knife. Uh, <laughs> and everyone else in there, of course, is like a, a newspaper clerk. So they're like, oh, it's some guy with a knife. <laughs> um, Dodger sorts it out very quickly. Uh, and writers are wimps. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm saying that they were... <laughs> In Dickensian's London. Although I do really like... Oh, times he, have changed. When he first goes <laughs> yeah, to Fleet Street... We'd roll Street, up our sleeves and have a piece of it. The Thunderdome of Twitter has trained us all. <laughs> Don't mess with crossword makers. <laughs> no. Oh, I would, I would never. Uh, so they have a crossword with you. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do like how his impression of the newspapers is not very favourable even when he first arrives. He talks about how the uh, printing presses are uh, demanded to be fed every day with a diet of politics, horrible murders and death. And it's always horrible murders. There's never any H in that word, which mm. I, I quite enjoyed. It's a good line though, isn't it? Mm. And that becomes the first time that the papers are writing about him and they start up a subscription for him, which basically means we're going to collect a bunch of money and give it to him as a reward, mm. which was how a lot of things were paid for in those days. It's how most statues got erected. They yeah, it's like possible on crowdfunding. It, it was it's very much, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had Kickstarter in my Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dickensian it, Kickstarter. That's where it all comes from is that idea of patronage. That's mm, why we have yeah. Patreon now. Mm. But yeah, he, uh, he tells Charlie what he knows, which is not a great deal at this stage, but better than nothing. Yep. And Charlie sends him on his way with a bit of extra information because Charlie's been obviously doing his own finding out of things. And he also gives him an even more thorough interview than before. Um, where one of the lines I really enjoyed was when he tells Charlie his real name, like his birth given name at least, but we don't find out what it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, until much later in the book. And you just assume it's going to be Oliver Twist, or if you're me, because that's what you want it to be. <laughs> you're like, yeah. oh, it's going to all come back together. And then he later asks for more soup. And I'm like, it's definitely going to be Oliver Twist. And then it's not. It's not. No. That's a twist. Yeah. But I did like when he said, you know, what do you think you'd do if you had like a different name? And he gives him a couple of options like Jeffrey Smith or Jonathan Baxter. And you're like, those are, are those references or something? They seem like quite uh, normal names. Uh, but he says, oh, I probably would have been a normal person, sir. <laughs> Which I thought was, I loved that line. I thought that was cute. But I also enjoyed when they go to talk in the coffee shop, which is um, chosen because it's going to be quiet and Charlie's reassuring him saying, nobody's going to hear what you say here because in here everybody is always talking at once and the ones who aren't actually talking are thinking about what they're going to say next and waiting for their turn. (laughs) And that was far too real. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, See, wow. some things don't change. Yeah. You're saying before that there's some sections of the book that feel a bit repetitive. I think I think the, the plot itself has a few beats that repeat itself, but each time you learn new things and you're in a new setting. I still feel that a large part of this is trying to capture that Dickensian spirit where there is a lot of repetition. And when Dickens was writing, as when you know Conan Doyle was writing, a lot of other people, they were writing by subscription and they were writing as a serial. So True. they were writing... They were, he was publishing two chapters at once and sometimes those chapters were very, very short, and then you wouldn't get the next one until the next issue of the magazine, the periodical, came out. Um, so you weren't buying it as one long novel, which is partly the reason why they're so long, because you know, and you get paid for as long as the novel goes yeah, that's on. Right. Yeah, per word. But it also means that he would repeat things because it's ten percent recap. Yeah, yeah, it's ten percent uh, last time yeah, in Charles right. Dickens, <laughs> like um, a MasterChef. Yeah, right. <laughs> You've so, just joined us. So I think there's, I think there's elements of that. Dickens is well known to have written to fill space to meet the demands of his publishers. Great Expectations, for example, had to fill 10 columns of the magazine all year round every week for 36 weeks. Thus, he employs not only a great deal of repetition, but also many long lists. Dodger goes back to visit um, Simplicity again. This is where we get the first stirrings of that romance that none of us were really convinced by. Um, There's a great line which says, his heart, somewhat corroded, was beating fast, (laughs) Uh, which I think is when he's uh, talking to her and she says something kind to him. But that's also the scene where we find out that simplicity maybe is not at all simple because her accent changes, like all the trace of her 
weird European accent sort of disappears, you just get a few little hints dropped that there's something more to her. And I, you know, I can't, I wish she had been more of a presence in the book because I'm like, I'm interested in who this person is. And we only ever really get glimpses of it. And then when she reveals herself more fully in the sense that we find out what she's capable of, we still never really learn how she learned to do those things or what she's done with those skills in the past. Um, and it's all a bit of a mystery. And yeah, it's I, good, yeah. I, I felt like that was a bit of a missed opportunity, maybe. They make her simple, then they make her seem a lot more complex and they kind of drag her back. She starts off seeming like typical damsel in distress. Mm. Then you're like, oh, maybe she can do all these things. Is she like? But then towards the end of the book, how she turns out, she's pulled back a little. And my comparison is in the first episode of Buffy, because, you know, with pilots of TV shows all bets are off. You're just trying to sell your show to the network. Yeah, yeah. Buffy can jump over a fence like she's flying. She can't do that ever again. No. Like, so it's kind of like, oh, let's see what... Yeah. yeah we'll the stick. network's feedback said, you know, less of the, um, you know, the superpowers and more of the, you know, the grit. Yeah, it's like a producer's come and go, you know, less of that. And, yeah. yeah, the audience said this. <laughs> Not enough laughs in the test screen. <laughs> yeah. It does remind me though, um, when, she, when we're finding out about her accent, he's trying to figure out where she's from and he can't, do it. And he's heard all the accents because he's spent time on the docks. And he knows all the phrases for appointment to the naughty ladies. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever known someone who has that thing where they're just obsessively, they learn one phrase in as many languages as possible? <laughs> Have you ever done that? I've known a few people. Yeah, I know a guy who knows thank you in about, you know, 48 languages. So at least that's a useful phrase. Yeah, thank you is pretty good. Yeah. Well, like, cerveza por favor is like... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See? Uh, but he's trying to figure out what's going on with her and thinking about that time of his life. Uh, And there's a great line where he says he he used to direct people in the right direction to find the naughty ladies. Mm. Um, Or as he grew older, he realised some people would say that was, in fact, the wrong direction. Mm. There were two ways of looking at the world, but only one when you were starving. And I was like, yeah, that's a great line. And there's also an interesting point. You mentioned her dropping her accent a little bit. And I'm not sure if this is slightly before or slightly after, but it's when Sharp Bob, the dodgy lawyer, is um, taken to a mysterious place and he's introduced to someone like this there was something in the voice which disturbed sharp bob it was english but not quite english as if a foreigner had learned english absolutely perfectly but hadn't been able to include all the little usages that a native born speaker would have picked up in fact as english it was too good too perfect lacking the slurs and imperfections that the native users sprinkled on their conversations yeah and that is the only scene in the book without dodger Mm. in it and that's not from his perspective. And it's to give us this ominous view of the villain who we then never find out who they are. One thing, you know, just before that, just before we get to that scene, Dodger goes around looking for more information. But this time he goes down near the docks and he's asking all the entertainers. And he has this great moment where he sees the Punch and Judy show and is suddenly like, why do we watch some guy beating up his wife for entertainment? This is not okay. And there's a great quote actually from Charles Dickens about the Punch and Judy show where he feels, and it's a bit like the modern discussion about video games or cartoon violence, where he says, no, people understand that that's not real. They don't see it as a model for behavior. And they quite enjoy the fact that they can have this release of tremendous violence without anybody getting hurt. And I'm like, oh, well, that's how we talk about cartoons and how we know kids find violent cartoons funny, but they don't go around hitting each other with hammers. Um, But it's still, there's that essential kind of undercurrent of, about what Punch gets up to in Punch and Judy. Uh, But while he's there, he also talks to someone who's a crown and anchor man. And I looked and I could not find out. It's some sort of gambling game, Mm -hmm. which is said to be much fairer than Thimble Rig, which is the, um, you know, the... Which is also find the the lady. Also find the lady or three card Monty, as the modern version would be Mm. called. But I couldn't find out what... What crown and anchor was? Yeah, or sharps, or hawks, or needlers, or knickers. Um, there's lots of stuff going and there's on. There's the barnacle, who's the guy who pretends to get sucked in, but he's actually part of the. He's the. Um, well, that's uh, a great term for it. He's the, the insider. That's yeah. Great. Also, that was then changed to Barnard, and he was Mister Barnard. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, but the crown and anchor, I think, is very similar to that idea of pick a card, any card. Oh, they right. were a type of deck, you know, with cra- with crowns and anchors oh. as the um, as the suit, but much yeah. fairer than uh, than the standard one. Yeah. All the light entertainment mentioned in this, though, all sort of has a heft to it because you can't, like Punch and Judy is pointing out violence is bad, Mm. to simplify that horribly. Find the Lady, which is kind of a theme throughout the book as Mm. well. Social La Femme, which Mm. actually gets said in the book as well, yeah. And there's also Happy Families because Solomon himself points out how Happy Families makes families unhappy. It's almost as though he's played 
monopoly yeah. the family the way he mm. describes it where children learn to deceive their parents it's all about lying and it makes your happy family into some sort of puddle of despair but i just found it interesting how all of those were a comment um like they're included to make a comment about things in the book mm. so, yeah. that's true but yeah then we have that scene where um sharp bob is being interviewed and he really wants he needs to go to the toilet the whole time while he's listening to the man with the bizarre accent that he can't place um or no accent rather and um, we hear the first mention of the Outlander, mm. uh, which is, I don't know, it just made me think of, um, uh, what's the TV series where the woman it's goes Outlander? back in time? Oh, it's, right. Is it called it's Outlander? It's Outlander. Yeah, I was just thinking of that and I'm like, that's not an appropriate well, connotation. Walkers. Oh, well, for me, it was just, uh, I love the fact that uh, that name started to cast such a spectre on the book. Yeah. And mm. I thought that's, that's very artful plotting because the mm. Outlander became a louder and louder threat uh, as the book you know, drew to its climax. Yeah. There was a moment where for I was like, is Solomon going to be the outlander? Oh, Cause he's yeah. had this whole backstory where he's traveled all around the world. And I was like, is it going to be, and yeah. he, I was like all these hints of how he can change how he looks very carefully. Like there's that bit where he shows up in his Freemason oh, clothes. I, I didn't go there at all, but gee, that's a really interesting plot idea. Yeah. There was also one of the chapters, cause this also, we should mention this book very unusually for Pratchett, is chaptered. Yeah, I read about this. He, he has an aversion to chapters. Yeah. I don't get it all, but I know I, he said in his defence, because I've been reading a lot about uh, his, his life and his, his attitudes and things, he said that, you know, we don't live life in chapters, so why should books? Yeah. Um, but this book, it was crying out for chapters, I thought. Oh, yeah. Well, if you're going to write in the Hicken style, it's very yeah, difficult not yeah. to. But not only does it have chapters, but it also has the like sort of little descriptions of what's going to happen in the chapters. And one of them is like Solomon shows his true colours or something like mm. that. And I was like, what, we're going to find out, is he going to be evil? What's going on? <laughs> no, don't betray him, Solomon. You're so nice. I like you as a character. And thankfully he didn't. But I, I too worried that he was going to turn out to be a villain. Yeah. Um, I just like that because he doesn't like chapters. When he does do them, he goes full chapters. He's like, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do a little description. I'm going to have a little picture on yeah, it. Yeah, little pictures. Yeah, it's just yeah. Uh, if you're going to do something, just go all in. And you're right, Ben, it is very Dickensian, which also goes with this idea of the writing style. The book has a lot of Dickensian uh, tropes and and, Mm. uh, touches. Uh, But it's not too long after the mention of the Outlander, um, uh, he goes back and talks to Solomon for a while, which is the first time um, that Solomon name drops Karl Marx, although he never says Marx, he only ever says my friend Karl. Yeah, with a big beard. Who said all this stuff that was quite clearly about socialism although he never uses any of the big freight like he never says oh carl was always talking about seizing the means of production He's like no he never says that <laughs> quite but he does say uh, talk about you know people being downtrodden and he name drops him about four times during the book without <laughs> ever mentioning his last name it's very cheeky and they have a nice discussion about various things um and we find out a bit more about solomon but that's also where he's um he's got to get really cleaned up because he's going to go to a proper dinner because by this time, Simplicity, has she been moved yet? Yeah, so after they have that mm. chaperoned walk mm. um, with the housemaid who's come around to him finally, they realise they're being followed, so Dodger stops him. Again, it's sort of a down-and-out friend of his who he manages to intimidate. They realise it's too dangerous to take her back to where they've been, so they take her to somewhere new via mm-hmm. Charlie. Yeah, Charlie knows someone who, who has a perfect place for her to stay. But we've also skipped over an important point that sort of lubricates the doors of a lot of places which is his encounter with Sweeney Todd. He's going to go to this high society dinner and Solomon insists he must clean himself up and get a better haircut and a shave Uh, and Dodger says well I know someone who can do that so he goes to a barber shop on Fleet Street where there's a very frazzled uh, barber Yes, whose name is Sweeney Todd. And there's a smell, like a strange smell. A strange smell in the shop, yeah. And again, this is Dodger being in the right place at the right time. It's also the first appearance of a fictional character who's outside of the fictional characters within the book. I mean, Mm. we've had Mayhew and Dickens. But I had, um, I've been looking up Sweeney Todd and he was, uh, he's based on an urban myth. He was created as a classic uh, penny dreadful idea but it's kind of cheeky of Pratchett to adopt a character from outside his own creation mm. and throw it in and use it as a really important pivot point in this plot yeah. um, it kind of does your head in which is I think obviously one of the joys of Pratchett mm. is that he's basically drawn from another narrative whether it's a fairy tale or whether it's a well-known uh, story within the western canon 
<laughs> he's used this character as a means of opening another door within his own uh, narratives. Oh, and I, that's really transgressive and also really exciting yeah, with that kind yeah. of stuff. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I was kind of like London All Stars as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He had to be. He had to be selected. You know, even if he didn't exist, he had to come off the bench. When Sweeney Todd showed up, mm-hmm. I was like, "Oh, does this is this going to turn into the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen?" Like, because <laughs> I I'm a big fan of that comic book series. I was like, "Oh, I'm pretty sure everyone else who's been in this so far has been real." Is it? What is who else is going to turn up now? Yeah, and I just right. got very excited. Um, but it was really just him. But that's fine because I love Sweeney Todd. Yeah, great character. Big fan of the musical. Uh, it had very little to do with this <laughs> story. Um, there's no, there's no uh, Mrs. Um, what's her name? Mrs. Miggins. Oh, unless she's very good and doesn't get get nicked. Nicked. Yeah. Uh, I like oh, that. oh yes. Oh, mm. yeah, very funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he does disarm Sweeney Todd. Gets rid of his razor. Who is um, only killing people because he's suffering from severe mm. trauma post being a barber surgeon during the Napoleonic Wars. Mm. And he talks about how it seems like the dead are coming back to haunt him and he tried his best to save them. But he'd see men who had legs obliterated by cannonballs, that kind of thing. So Dodger has a lot of sympathy for him, disarms him, just as all the police burst in or the, the peelers. Yeah, the peelers. Actually, that's a really good point, Liz, thinking about this sociological aspect of this book and how Terry's often coming in with those sorts of uh, apologias, defence of what would seem criminal action. There's something really perverse and wonderful about doing that to the Sweeney Todd character because what he does is he makes Sweeney Todd real. Mm. Mm. Yeah. By, by giving him a true motivation for his psychosis mm. suddenly this fictional character and almost like a um, fictional talisman of of old london takes on flesh and blood because of um, post-traumatic stress disorder um, dodger has met him firsthand so the idea of a fictional character becoming real through the you know catalyst of a pratchett novel is just really exciting and weird mm. yeah for what he takes from the fiction, he's mm. more drawing on the original Penny Dreadful version because mm. the, the later versions of the story often include the character having been transported to Australia. This character is not someone who's been transported to Australia. Or They're, Van Diemen's Land, as they call it in um, the yeah. book at one point. Yeah, which... Uh, which and then seems, they call it Australia again later. Well, I mean, it's very definitely called Australia by this. And in fact, it was references like that that put me off as to when it was set. I was like, wait a minute. It's one of those settings that you see as a sort of just a different place. Victorian London and you don't necessarily think about how it matches up because I constantly forget that Victorian London is more or less at the same time as Cowboys right like <laughs> it's in fact it's a little bit early for Cowboys but that's it's around it's the same time and you, it's not until you see something like the TV series Penny Dreadful where the Victorian characters travel to America and there's Cowboys and you're like oh yeah um but anyway Sweeney gets taken off Either to the hangman's noose or possibly to Bedlam. Which is worse um, if you don't have money. Yeah, and Dodger thinks it's not really fair that he should suffer either of those horrible fates because clearly, you know, his experiences are as much to blame as he himself is, which is um, very understanding of him. But once again, he's in the right place at the right time. Charlie Dickens shows up almost immediately as well. As you were saying, he sort of just teleports yeah. to wherever <laughs> Dodger is. I, I once played a... Um, a role-playing game based on the Asterix. And I got to play as Asterix oh, wow. from the Asterix Noblex comics. And my special power w- was I could go, buy to Tutus! Uh, and someone would just take me to where the plot was happening. And I felt like that's what Charlie Dickens' special power is <laughs> yeah, in this book. Like so. He's just like, take me to the plot! I must be part of the narrative. And he just shows up anytime it's happening. But it seems like he's got his ear to the ground and he knows what's going on, so he would have heard instantly. But he's also writing the book. Mm. That's the thing. Yeah. So that's that's why I say he's the architect of the book yeah. because Terry Pratchett's created this notion or this this possibility. Mm. So no wonder he knows where to turn up because that's the scene he's writing next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he's famous again and even more so he's going to have an even bigger subscription. And is this when he gets given part of his subscription? It's when someone in the shop announces it then when he goes out with Charlie like a little bit later. That's right. He's collected about 50 sovereigns for him. But there's a little bit of passage of time before he actually gets the money. It's a lot of money. There's a famous Benjamin too that's coming up very shortly. Oh, yes, very much so. Uh, Because uh, he not long after that, um, he, he he goes to see... Um, Simplicity installed in her new um, abode Mm -hmm. with um, Angela, um, who I did not know when I was reading the book is a real person. I did not know that. 
Well, so others you can detect that they're yeah. real, but yeah. So, uh-huh. and, and pretty much per script as, uh, as she appears in the Yeah, book. she mm. was fabulously wealthy. Um, she inherited a massive amount of money from her grandfather from the family business. And she really did give loads of it away to charity and do all the things that's described in the book. She supported the beggars' mm. schools and she was a big um, advocate for animal rights as well. She was a beekeeper, which is, I thought was a very nice wow. touch. Yeah, so she... she an apiarist. Yeah, an apiarist. What a she life. Was one of, she what, was a, what a remarkable real. woman. This is when... Solomon insists that Dodger really has to get nicely mm, done yeah. up before he goes to this party where um, he's going to meet all these important people. And that's where he has to go to a real tailor in Savile Row. Earlier on, before he went to Sweeney Todd, he talked about how he used to brush his hair and a whole bunch of nits would come out and he'd jump up <laughs> and down on it. And that, you don't get rid of nits that way. It's just this like a Band-Aid sh- solution. This when you had your third shower of, yeah. <laughs> of the novel. Yeah, and also like shaved my head. But... Um, <laughs> mm. So I was like, oh, well, first he's contaminating Sweeney Todd's place and like he's going around all these different places just leaving nits, but I guess everywhere had nits yeah. then. It was one of those things too where he used a word that reminded you sometimes words really do just mean what you think they mean. Like, yeah. Because he says he didn't want to be a nitwit. And I was like, <laughs> oh, it really, it really did just come from people who were scratching their head all the time because they had nits, <laughs> not because they were idiots. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. Uh, I thought, is that, that, is that, that is yeah, the real it's derivation the same way as of nitpicking, you know, the, um, the monkey habit of just going through, a, you know, a mate's uh, fur and picking it out in the same way that pedants will just pick the smallest detail on a page. Mm. So that sort of puts pedants in quite a kind light, <laughs> really. <laughs> I'm a primate pedant. So Sorry, I think we on. just um, skipped a bit. So basically yeah. he goes on that chaperoned walk, he finds they're being followed, so they go to Parliament after being told that's where Charlie is going to be. That's right, and that's where he meets Disraeli. And he gets through the doors by being the hero that took down the demon barber of Fleet Street, which is now what he's being mm-hmm. called by the papers because mm. that's how quickly the story has become polar. Yeah. And so he gets in and he meets Benjamin Disraeli, who seems like a dodger like himself, but a bit fancier. Yeah. Yeah, he sees him as, a, as another geezer, only <laughs> now he's in the halls of parliament. Pretty good 48 hours, you'd have to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. From a bloke who just shot up from the sewers to suddenly yeah. meeting the, you know, the prime minister and uh, having the, um, the greatest... A chronicler of London at his elbow, and yeah. it has that aspect to it of things just escalating magically and uh, mercurially, yeah. uh, which is you know the joy of the book too. And he does hang a lampshade on it, like when there's that bit when uh, I think it's on the third night when Dodger's going to sleep and he's thinking about all the crazy things that have happened, and he goes, "How long has it been? It's been, it's been three days." Mm. What? And he, he's like just a bit freaked out by it, which seems reasonable. Yeah, that caught my eye too because it, it has been such a tumultuous narrative and quite right you know that's the sun's only sunk twice and so this is the end of the third day so they have the meeting at parliament where they find out some more things about simplicity and her background and why it's perhaps not as simple to look after her as they might think because there's a political element to her case because the person that she was married to uh who wants her back is not an Englishman. And so that could be a diplomatic incident if they, you know, do not find some way around this problem. He's a prince, and so she's technically a princess. Mm, which that... freaks him out a bit, as you might imagine, yes. And there's that sort of really great line about how princes and princesses getting married is a political option. And so there's that thing about how he wasted his flesh kind of thing. And I thought it was weird that it was like, oh, he wants her back. But I'm like, no, he wants her dead. Because everyone else who witnessed the marriage is dead. And then, again, the thing, the part of me that wants everything to tie up neatly in a bow was like, oh, it's going to be that Jack the Ripper conspiracy. That all the witnesses to a wedding of a foreign power prince to a common lady um, were the victims of Jack the Ripper, which very much is not true. But I thought that was going to be where that was going. This is where one of um, uh, Sharp Bob's friends comes after Dodger, not long after that. And he's wandering around near um, home and there's a whole digression about flower girls and he's remembering a time when he dressed up as a flower girl because there was some gent who was preying on them and he dressed up as one so that he could beat the crap out of this guy. Uh, And and I really liked that because he was distracted and then he gets, um, you know, you know, a hand lands on his shoulder and there's a knife at his throat. Um, at the same time, we're distracted because we're talking about something that's not related to the plot. And for yet a it moment. is. It is. It's Chekhov's gun, too, because oh, true, he relies yeah. on drag for an, a yeah. key part of the novel to come. That's true. So it's it's Chekhov's, Chekhov's transvesti- 
transvestite wardrobe. <laughs> Chekhov's corset? <laughs> Chekhov's corset. There we go. Um, and I would like to nitpick one point from mm. that scene where he goes, mm. not one muscle moved except for the sphincter. And I just feel like my four years at medical school would be wasted if I didn't point out that the body has more than one sphincter. Yeah, and yeah, they're so. not very specific there, are they? Yeah, so like, oh, so his gastroesophageal sphincter is, like, oh, whatever. I had real trouble with that line because I laughed at it, you know, because we know that, you know, not a muscle move is just an expression. But I, I laughed at it thinking, oh, that's a nice gag. Um, but then I thought, gee, would they say that? Would Dickens say sphincter? I, I had a problem as a, uh, not that, I mean, the word has been around for, you know, five, six centuries, but it just felt... Um, <laughs> the gag was funny. Mm. I laughed, but there was you've got a medical hassle, I've got a linguistic hassle with that uh, line too. Yeah, so it's a, a line for a lot of gripes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dip pickers are going crazy here. Well, maybe it was his sphincter of Odie, which is the one that like controls bile oh, coming into your yeah. intestines. Well, so. they would have still been uh, on the bile theory at the time. This was when it was all changing, wasn't it? Yeah, the four humours were certainly getting thrown yeah. out. Mm. This was when they were starting to dissect people, as, as is mentioned in one of the throwaway mm. lines in the book, that that's where a lot of the bodies of the poor end up under a knife in a medical college. Yeah, but just to, I mean, because that's the one that comes from the gallbladder, maybe that is why that line was so galling. <laughs> Let's <you're> terrible. Uh, <laughs> but I enjoyed that. I enjoyed I'm just that. spewing bile here, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, God. I guess not. I guess not. Um, oh, well, actually, the other thing, though, about that bit is he's also, that's where he mentions um, how big London is. And he talks about the square mile, which is like the tiny bit of actual the city of London, which if you ever visit London is is marked by these bollards with the seal of the city oh, of London on them. them here. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but also um, he refers to the bits outside of the square mile as the outer wastes, <laughs> which just made me think of a post-apocalyptic nightmare. And Dodger wandering around with like, you know, Mad Max style dudes in like <laughs> big pointy armor. Um, but it's also where uh, a conversation he has just before um, this man gets the drop on him, uh, before he goes outside. Uh, Solomon says to him, I'm Jewish. We know about these things, which is basically what all the wizards in all of his books say. And I was like, Solomon's a wizard. He's a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Um, and I thought that was that was quite good. But yeah, he uh, he deals with uh, Sharp's Bob, Sharp Bob's man, Sharp Bob, who was the the man meeting with the um, unusually uh, non-accented shadowy figure, uh, has employed a ruffian to go and watch Dodger and then accost him and try and get him to tell him where simplicity is. But he um, manages to get out of there. He dodges him, yeah, and then kicks him. him in the fork, which is another phrase we hear a lot in uh, in a lot of <laughs> Fratchett's books. Yeah, the next day is when uh, Dodger goes and deposits his uh, his fat little wad of um, cash into the bank, um, which is the bank owned by the family of uh, Simplicity's new wealthy friend who Solomon she's staying with. Negotiates him a fantastic deal that um, mostly was made so that he would get out of the building and stop haggling. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and he has a really busy day that day because he goes to the bank. Uh, he goes back to the offices um, of... Um, uh, actually, I think he goes back to Charlie's newspaper, but he goes there to meet Tennille, the illustrator, who's going to draw a picture of him for Punch. And I assume that's the same Tennille who illustrated Alice mm. in Wonderland. Yeah. And there's a little anecdote about how Dodger picks up he's got a scar across his eye and I didn't get a chance to look that up, but Not I assume all, that's actually. true. Yeah. No, I made it. I, did you look it up? No, I didn't. That'll no, be I'm one for the show notes. So okay. have, check out the show yeah. notes for that. I'll, I'll look up what the deal is with that good. because they, mm. they heavily intimate that something serious, well, there was something serious about that and more than um, Tennille was letting on, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so I, I will follow that mm. up. Um, but then he goes to the Turkish baths and has an amazing massage, which is when Solomon gives him the idea for the plan, mm. the, how he's going to get simplicity out of this jam. It's a good plan. Can I just, on a language front, mm. I love the fact that the plan was divulged across parallel tables in a, a massage room. <laughs> I think that was a really clever plot device. As Solomon's speaking, he starts to have these mmms, little mmms of pleasure as the masseuse <laughs> sort of hits the right spots. Mm. But did either of you notice that Solomon continues with the mmms long after the Turkish oh, bath? He starts them well Does before. Does he start before? And there is, okay. there's a, there is a passage describing that he always speaks like that. Okay. But then right. in this instance, he does it even even more so. His just mm's slightly. proliferate after yeah. the Turkish bath. It's almost like yeah. Terry's thinking... 
Well, he enjoyed it so much. Or <laughs> that uh, there's a... Um, I'll just keep, keep with this gag. Because it's a bit of a gag in the end. Oh, yes. Yeah. Has, has this um, mannerism. Well, maybe the masseuse is following them for the rest of the plot and we just don't <laughs> yeah, get that's shown. that's right. Every time he's speaking, I, just, uh, I, I picture this sort of Turkish guy completely, you know, pummeling his back. Yeah, just wearing a towel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I say mannerism, I mean, mm, mannerism. Mm, <laughs> mm, mannerism. Mm, mm. Um, and then, uh, and then it's the next thing they've got to do is he's got to get... This is where he actually goes to the tailor to Suit get some up. proper clothes. Yeah. Uh, and it's also the, the car chase scene or the carriage chase, to be more accurate, because they're in a growler, which is a great word for... What, where does that come from, David? Do you, did you I find looked that up out? growler in... I've got several of these uh, glossaries from the Elizabethan period, and growler did not come up. Yeah. Huh. So I reckon growler actually might be a Pratchettism. Oh, well, see, I don't know, because I definitely feel like Have I've heard it, it before. Okay. But... It's used so often in the book. I think it must be a real term. Uh, well, actually, growler did come up, but it was more of a um, uh, like a, a a rogue or a, or a yeah. cad. But I don't know if if growler was a was a carriage or a mode of transport, which but, is a bit more how we use it now, as yeah, like a yeah. cad. But but yeah, it means a carriage. Yeah, like and particularly a cab. I think because it's always a handsome yeah. cab that they're getting in. But I mean, there's different things it could be to guess because it could be taxi drivers do shout at people quite a lot as a cyclist <laughs> i've experienced that um so they could be quite growly yeah, or drivers. rubbish rubbish uh, shocks or suspension yeah yeah it was good and it also it created this uh it heightened the fantasia in that you've got toshes catching growlers and yeah. heading off to rookeries all that sort of felt quite fun i just had a quick look in um in dodger's guide to london which we'll talk about later but it does have a little little list oh, yeah. and it says a growler is specifically a four-wheeled cab there you go but mm. but it doesn't have any derivation so i don't know where it comes from but i'll see if i can find that out for the show yeah, although if I've you got... couldn't find it i don't think i can uh, <laughs> well i've got two books in my satchel over there and they're pretty comprehensive and neither of those yeah, uh, interesting. had a growler but that's not to say that you know it was um, lying elsewhere. Might be one of those words where we just don't know anymore mm. why, where it came from. Yeah, it's maybe sad. it's you know there's that thing called the Mount Weasel where you protect um, the copyright of material by throwing in one fabrication. Oh maybe yeah, maybe it's a Mount Weasel or a trap street. Like yeah, a little trap street. Yeah, oh, could be a trap wow. word. Um, so there you go. Well, they have this chase because he hears the noise again, and it's not the first time he's heard it. He also previously heard it whilst in the sewers mm-hmm. in his shonky suit. And he tried to follow the noise of the um, the screeching carriage, which must be the same one that um, deposited Simplicity onto the the, uh, the road. But um, but he is thwarted at getting out of the sewers at the appropriate place because there's a um, there's a, a a beer wagon parked on top, and the um, horses um, well they urinate on him, uh, which is <laughs> which is a shame. Although they do make the point of saying that it makes clothes rather clean, even if they don't smell. <laughs> so the best. Wind, wind and also. It belongs to the beer truck people and isn't beer sometimes horse piss if it's bad. That is true. So That's very true. It's thwarted by horse piss. Oh, oh. And I was I was quite surprised it does use the word piss in the book. Lion's piss for the cider. Um yeah, and I I'm like, oh, this you don't often see a real swear word in a Pratchett book. Is it a swear word? Uh, uh, piss is all right. Yeah. Oh, look, yeah. Look, I mean, look, we're Australian. So it's not like the George Carlin, our... seven words you can't say. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But it, our, our standards for what is a swear word are pretty low, I feel, in Australia. It's like, um, yeah, that's not really a swear word. But um, Well, also, uh, too, if it was for young adult, it's probably, you know, it's testing the friendship, but it felt right. I mean, sometimes oh, yeah, no, it, it can be pretty ordinary. It's, it's like a cheeky right. wink. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's that. There's, while they're trying to have this chase, he's trying to follow them. There's basically a traffic jam in the middle of London, and I love the bit where the where the cab driver's like, "Ah, oh, it's one of those, it's one of those four horses up there. They shouldn't allow them in the city." And I'm like, "Oh, you'd be pleased with the congestion tax of today, wouldn't you?" Which is, uh, if you don't know, is uh, cars have to pay quite a hefty fee to drive in the middle of London these days. So a lot of people choose not to, and um, it's really lessened the congestion there. But isn't that um, you know quintessential Pratchett? In that he will, you know, bring up contemporary issues, but he use using the using kind of more uh, sort of fan, fantastical or imaginative means of exploring a contemporary problem. Mm. Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's and, textbook project. Yeah, it is. It, so it's, I, I thought it was a nice touch. Yeah, and it's Piccadilly Circus, which is notoriously bad for traffic mm-hmm. still. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so they just have to get out and walk, and they lose the cab. They can't find it, um, and they in danger of running late to get to um, his uh, appointment at the um, tailor's. Um, but they get a good deal on a suit because someone accidentally, an apprentice accidentally made one for another client with the wrong measurements. So they quickly um, alter that to fit him. 
But they end up at the party. The big fancy party where it is a who's who of it is a who's that who. era. Oh, yeah. who's who. I did make a little list of people who appear at that party. It's quite amazing. Um, there's obviously Charles Dickens and Benjamin Disraeli. Um, but also Joseph Bazalgett, who becomes famous after the time of this. Um, he was a great reformer who rebuilt the uh, London sewers and drainage system. Um, there's um, George Cayley uh, and uh, William Henderson, who I don't think is actually at the party, but is mentioned, who are uh, scientists of the time, biologists. Uh, Henry Mayhew is there uh, with his wife Jane. Charles Babbage is there with Arda Lovelace. Is Arda um, there? Yeah. Arda is there. I, didn't, I, 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 I was named, looking for the name check. I didn't notice yeah, that. She was I was, there. must have been hurrying through this bit. Uh, she's <laughs> only mentioned briefly. It's yeah, Solomon okay. meets them both. Who is a most elegant lady and a credit to her father, is how I she's described. I can't believe I missed Ada. Yeah. Um, she's a favourite of mine. World's first computer programmer. Yeah. If, you don't know, if you don't know who she is, look her up. Uh, we'll put a note about her in the show notes as well. Um, and, of course, Sir Robert Peel. Now, we've mentioned Peelers a few times. And this is the name for the new, more modern police force introduced by Sir Robert Peel. Yeah, I got really interested in Peel because the way that he was portrayed in the book, he seemed as though he was uh, really had a lot of street cred and a, a lot of street savvy. And I looked him up, and his biography is as silver spoon as it gets. You know, he's a, <laughs> he's a boy from Harrow. He his father was a a, a plutocrat through the textile industry, so he was. Extremely privileged, very upper uh, upper class, was a, a Whig, an arch conservative Whig at that. Joined Parliament very early, but I, I'm going to I'm going to forgive uh, Terry here because even though he comes across as being very arch and very um, of the street, I'd imagine in his role as being the creator of the police force, you would need to be, and it's almost as though he had his uh, his his ancestry, which would make him quite the toff. Mm. But then his vocation, which would make him very much a, a sort of shrewd operator, so uh, which is all we see when it comes to Peel in this book. Mm. Um, and it made me think uh, that possibly Pratchett may have been wiser to say, despite the fact that he had such a, a plum you know, boyhood and a, 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 a privilege, he knew how to read the likes of Dodger because all, all you get from the page is that he was essentially Dodger in a fancy suit mm. uh, yeah. because he could read, he could read the, um, straight through the lies of Dodger, straight through the pretenses of Dodger. Um, yeah, the other side, the schmoozing, yeah. would have allowed him to make more changes that he wouldn't have been able to make if he was just street smart and yeah. didn't come from the plummy background mm. as well. Yeah. Yeah, and they make they do make quite a lot of references to the fact that the Peelers were very new at the time. Yeah, um, and uh, they make several references to the Bow Street Runners, who are the sort of their predecessors. Who are, uh, I think they're just sort of dismissed as basically thief takers, which means they just sort of if they see someone stealing something, they just run after them um, without any real sort of meth- method to their yeah. madness. Plus, I love their eighties pop. Yeah. <laughs> Street Runners. Yes. Oh, I love it. Um, but yeah, he meets all these amazing people and he has that interview with, um, they have the amazing dinner and he sits next to Simplicity um, at Angela's behest and they have this incredible meal and then he realises he's full of wine um, so he's going to have to use the Jakes. Another word that I did not see, I did. I don't know what the derivation of that is but it's the word they use consistently throughout the book for the, the latrine or the toilet. Yeah, uh, it's to do with, uh, I think... Because they, Lou is from Le, uh, so the mm. water, mm. and I think that the whole idea of um, the the privy was very much a, a Norman concept um, before it used to be the chamber pot. So it's it, the reference is Jacques, I think it's like a the it's like a giving it a Norman name or a, a French name. Right, I'm pretty sure it's it has the Le Jacques background. I'm, don't quote me on that. Well, you've got me now. <laughs> but I think that's its origins. And okay. Did Crapper come later? Because that was those flushing toilets. Was Thomas Crapper? Yeah. Well, this is but this is sort of around the time of the introduction that's of the, first the time flushing he sees toilet. One. Yeah, it's the first time he's seen one. Um, and the first time a that's lot of people would have used one right there. was at the uh, the exhibition at the Crystal Palace um, when the public toilets there were flushing ones, which was a mm. weird experience for most people there. Um, yeah. So I think that is a bit later. Uh, but yeah, they have that interview in the in the in the Jakes. Yeah, in the Jakes. Well, dressed the same. Yeah, because whose suit was mismade by the Apprentice Tailor? Sir Robert Peel's. Another yeah. coincidence, yes. but but quite a delightful yeah, one. I loved it. Yeah. Uh, 
because he didn't know who it was. He's just like, oh no, it's the guy whose suit I've got. And then he realizes who it is. He's like, oh no, it's Robert Peel. What does he call him? The King of Peels? Yeah, the King of the King of Peelers, yeah. yeah it's, uh, oh, that's, that's very that. funny. Um, but this is also where we find out his real name because he tells his real name to Robert Peel, uh, which is Pip Stick, which is a, a very unfortunate name. It reminded me of nothing more than um, the nickname for, you know, that when you're playing pool yeah. and you, use, you have to, you, if, it, if it's really... A difficult shot. Oh, you have yeah. the the short the, cue, the cue, and you have the other cue that's got like the little sort of hoop on it, so you can position that oh, over that. a ball. Yeah, yeah okay. the cheating stick, the cheating stick, or the poop stick, as sometimes <laughs> it is called uh, in Australian slang. And I, that was what it made me think of, pip stick. But obviously, yeah, what a name to be made fun of with. And also has the pip pir- uh, great expectations mm. uh, echo too. Mm. Yeah, which uh, clearly is one of the notes that uh, the, <laughs> that Oliver, uh, sorry, not Oliver, Charlie has written down. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's there's our so mutual many. friend. Yeah, our mutual friend. Heaps good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so he finds out quite a bit there. He finds out that uh, uh, Sharp Bob is dead. Sharp Bob's mates are dead. He's like, oh, this is serious. And this is where he finds out that the Outlander is on the prowl. And Sharp Bob's dead to kind of frame Dodger. Like that's one of the oh, big yes. things as well because two people are saying that Dodger did it, but fortunately he was having this epic day of getting suits and having and pummeling had, massages. And yeah. had met with like reputable people. So they all have said, no, 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 he was with us. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so Robert Peel's like, well, look, you know, in the old days we would have just arrested you and called it quits, but I can tell it was not you. <laughs> so someone's <laughs> That's out That's also you. lovely, uh, that idea that he had such a prominent alibi because uh, I think there's a line somewhere else in the book about that he's invisible unless when he needs to be visible, you know, um, mm. in case in point. Yeah, this is a this is a time when he needed to be seen, and he was. Yeah. Um, but this is, I think, you know, I think fair to say this is where the narrative really picks up a bit of speed. This is where we're heading towards our conclusion rapidly. Um, Dodger's got his plan, and he knows he's only got a couple of evenings because the other thing that happens during the party is that he's approached by Basil Gett, who says, "Oh, you're a tosher." I want to go down into the sewers. Could you take me? And I can just imagine this like, you know, toffee upper class guy who's like very earnestly interested in all this stuff, but he's like, oh, you're down there all the time. You could take me down there. Dodger's like, uh, okay. Uh, but he says that, but he's also already challenged Benjamin Disraeli to go down there because Disraeli's sort of making fun of him. He says, oh, he says, yeah, well, I can be a, a gentleman and a tosher. Can you be both? <laughs> and he's like, Yes, he accepts the challenge. So it turns out he's planned for two nights, hence they're all going to go down. But before that, the night before that, they're going to go see Julius Caesar. But that means he's got two days to put his plan together, get everything, all the pieces together and put it into action. Um, and I like that because it's sort of, I like it when someone has a deadline. It just gives it that much more. Oh, yeah, yeah. things are going to happen. What's going to happen? Is he going to make it? Yeah. And I thought it was going to go wrong because we knew what the plan was going to be. And whenever they declare what the plan's going to be, it all goes wrong. Yeah, although I, I, I really liked that um, he never says in as many words what the plan is going to be, but you feel quite clever because you, you pretty easily work it out from the things that he does say. And I, I really like it when an author kind of assumes that cleverness on the behalf of the reader and just, just says, I don't need to tell you what it is. You know what it is. Well, he gives you a hint. I don't know how much we are allowed to say, but I do the hint which was set at the Turkish baths mm. was enough for readers to start to fill in the gaps because yeah. it was a great idea. Yeah. It was basically just imagine if she wasn't there to search for yeah. Uh, mm. that yeah. idea. And I thought, okay, yeah, that's quite clever. Um, and it, the whole thing just extrapolates within your imagination as you're imagining how that's going to play out. Yeah. And, and we don't, you know, we, have, we never get the, okay, well, I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I've yeah. got to do this. It's just he just does it. And mm. as he does it, he like going, what are you up to? Oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah. Right, yeah. And I really enjoyed that as it unfolded. While also making pleasant commentary about how poorly treated little old ladies are. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of options for, for lots of commentary there. Because in the course of his plan that next day, he goes to visit um, a, a head, uh, you know, a head naughty lady, for want of a better phrase. They keep calling them naughty ladies. It's not really... I mean, it's what they, they call also, in the book. It's what they call in the book. But they they also, you know, they refer to as soiled doves, and there's, um, which is actually a different thing. But there's all these other terms. Um, uh, but we're talking about sex workers, of course, uh, uh, in case that was confusing to anyone. Yeah. <laughs> just, soiled dove, naughty what? Just to, just to, just to make clear. Uh, but he goes to see a woman because he needs to know... Um, he needs to know certain things, which we are not told what they are. But he says, this is what I need to do without it being written in the book. And she says, okay, yes, well, you can definitely do that. Here's what you need. 
Um, I your favor. No worries. Watch out for yourself. It's dangerous out there. Um, and then that's when, uh, and he goes to see um, Josie, the soup seller, who he'd met previously. Yep. So lots of lots of stuff set up in advance in this book, which I really enjoyed. There's hardly any time a character just popped up out of nowhere. Like we'd already met all the people that were important to the final plot. But he goes to see Josie, the soup seller, and asks her for some favors as well and some information. And then he goes on a secret mission um, where he disguises himself as a little old lady. And there's this persistent theme there, which I quite enjoyed, where it says, if there was a, an observer on the moon looking down, they would see what was going on exactly from up there. Um, which just reminded me of the adventures of Baron Munchausen or, um, or Cyrano de Bergerac, where he talks about having fallen from the moon when he's distracting someone. I thought that was great. Um, but yeah, I, this but is, that's, yeah, like we've got Dodger dressed up as a little old lady with warts in strategic places and looking uh, very plausible and then visiting the coroner, which is the reason that uh, he ends up making this uh, mercy mission. And it, it's, it was always this, um, it's just, in a way, it's one reason why I am not naturally uh, a reader of fantasy books because I just thought the further this plan went out, the more uh, kind of um, suspension of belief was, was required on, on our part as a reader. Mm. And it's just enjoy the caper. You know, that's what I kept on saying to myself. Don't say, oh, hang on, how could he have been so eloquent and convincing this person that he was, in fact, um, female, that he was who he said he claimed to be? There's this kind of veracity reflex that I sometimes have as a reader, thinking it doesn't ring true, but the caper is all. And the, and the caper is, is a fine caper. Hmm. So that's... You know, Even with the presence of um, of uh, a Chekhov's corset, as we discussed earlier. Well, it it as you rightly said, everything was beautifully put in place, and the plotting is is fine. It's um, but if you keep following this line, the fact that someone can sneak up and tie shoelaces together, the fact that someone can dress convincingly and be convincing, and then there are two other things that happen uh, in the in the sort of end game of the book that again really stretched the imagination mm. to a point of I don't buy it but because it's in the spirit of the book I'll buy it for now oh. I choose yeah. to buy it yeah, yeah interestingly I did not I did not feel that way I, I enjoyed it a lot but uh, but uh, we'll, we're now I think we're at pretty much the end now we, we get, well, we're in the end game as you say um, so he sets up yeah. he sets up he goes he make, makes a visit to the coroner and makes some preparations mm-hmm. claims to be someone's relative who he is not um and then goes off to the play to see Julius Caesar, mm-hmm. which he doesn't really understand but enjoys, and then takes that opportunity to have a secret audience with Simplicity and Angela. And who else does he bring into the confidence? Solomon. Because mm. Charles Dickens is not in on the plan. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and again, explains to them what it is without the reader knowing explicitly what the plan is, but I think we've all figured it out by now. Um, and then uh, they're like, oh. and Angela's a bit like, I don't know about this plan. Normally I would say this is a terrible idea, but then she's looking at simplicity and simplicity is like clearly going, I like this plan. What a smart young man. And this is one of the few bits where I'm like, I can see why there's something going on between them. I mean, it escalates to a point that seems a bit unreasonable, but you can see someone going, oh yeah, you're sharp. I would have, th- I, I didn't think of this, but I think that's a great idea. And they mentioned during that scene that you both didn't like where it was from not Dodger's perspective that she'd escaped previously and got recaptured and she managed to completely obliterate one man's, like two fingers and one of the... Yeah, tore them off yeah. or something. Mm, so yeah. she's scrappy. Yeah, she's, she's a fighter. Yeah. She, can, she can hold her own and also she recognises a kindred spirit, as I said before, because clearly she is a chancer and a strategist mm. and you know, Dodger has come up with a really fine plan that Solomon helped to you know, uh, conspire. And the thing that convinces Solomon and Angela to say, all right, yep, will help you with this plan is that simplicity says I trust him I trust Dodger mm-hmm. um, which trust her Dodger yeah which yeah. is which is where it's all gone a bit oh. and I you know what I, I I as much as we complain about these these um, relationships and I do feel like it could have been built up better by that point I was like you know what I'm on board with this like I wish yeah, we got that was here maybe the scene to bring it on to to actually escalate it to that point of you know mutual 
you know, infatuation. Yeah, and I feel like we needed more lead up, as we were saying before. But but at that point, I was like, oh, you know what? I'm I'm okay with this. I think I think they are. This is this could work out well. See, I viewed that scene with a lot of cynicism because I was like, oh, she is a master manipulator, and she knows who's going to be the most help to her in this situation, and this is the way to get it. True. So I kind of viewed it like that because she knows how to Mm -hmm. get to what she needs. I did. I did have a feeling in the back of my head that that could be the way it goes. I was like, oh, she could be, she could turn out to betray him and like murder him. She's the outlander. No. Yeah. Well, what? No. <laughs> um, but well, uh, in the same way Tosha befriended the cook, you know, someone who's trapped will befriend their rescuer. You, yeah. You've got to go to the person who's going to be your best ally. Mm. So you could easily see that as being a, a, a kind of a Machiavellian uh, show oh, yeah. of affection. And that mm. could have been really, that yeah. would have been really interesting too, but it's not, but it's not what happens because the next day the plan is all put into action. Mm-hmm. Um, Dodger spends another, takes another trip uh, across town to the coroner's office, but this time comes back with a corpse, um, which he takes down to the sewers and expertly um, leaves there uh, with some, some stuff to stop the rats from eating it uh, and a few other hints and tips that he picked up from his, uh, his uh, naughty lady friend uh, on what to do with the corpse. And um, that sounds awful. That's not what I meant at all. Um, but... Um, then it's time for the expedition where Benjamin Disraeli and uh, Basil Gett and um, Charlie Dickens are all going to come down into the sewers with him, but they're joined by someone else who is supposedly one of Angela's footmen, um, but actually is Simplicity dressed up, fooling only Basil Gett, who has not already <laughs> met her. And I, I admit, when I first read that bit of the, the plot, I was like, oh no, why has she turned up? That's going to ruin everything. And it was only like, as it was going on, I was like, oh no, that's part of the plan. That's a genius part of the plan. And the initial bit where he's showing them around the drains and all of that, if that had a soundtrack, it would be Pulp's Common People. Yes. (laughs) Yes, it would. Because they're like, oh, isn't it fun to go toshing? Oh, and I found some coins. Yeah. (laughs) And she has a go and she finds a gold ring. And it's not just any old gold ring because one thing we've skipped over is that when Dodger fi- finds out which embassy uh, and therefore which country the prince who uh, is pursuing Simplicity is from, he um, he sneaks in there. Yeah, it's one of his lowest acts actually. Mm. It is, yeah. yeah he trashes the place. He does, but, he's, but he gets his – because he goes and retrieves his like secret stash of lockpicks that, he's, that yeah. he, he put mm. away because he promised Solomon <laughs> he wouldn't do this anymore and he, he breaks in. And he steals everything that's not nailed down, including a whole bunch of very sensitive diplomatic papers and a whole bunch of jewellery. And he considers burning the place down. He's like, "Mm, no, there's people asleep in here. I shouldn't really kill a whole bunch of people. I'm not a murderer. And then he goes out to the stables and finds the offending carriage, finally, after chasing it two or three times during the book. Um, scrawls Mr. Punch on the (laughs) side of it, which I thought was great, with the bit of it that makes it squeal, which he snaps off. Um, Make sure the horses are safe. Yeah, that was that was the only noble gesture he, he did. Yeah. And then he, sets fire to the that, stables. You know, felony. Um, are the horses safe though? They're just getting released into London, where they have been shown previously to show up in soup. Well, <laughs> that's true. Uh, well, that's more a French thing uh, for them to end up in soup. But I think people will, more will steal them. They'll get stolen. <laughs> yeah, and then they'll get ridden and looked after, and then possibly eaten, which is a bit sad. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, so he does do that, and uh, he's taken some of that jewelry, and this is where he uh, he tells Solomon what he's done, and Solomon is like, you know what, they pretty much deserve it. I'm okay with it this time, and I've got a friend who could fence those things for you. And he says, well, can you just keep a few of them and melt them down and make a new ring? And he makes a ring for simplicity, which is the ring she finds when she's toshing in the what sewer. Are the oh, it's very oh, it's so oh, romantic. He definitely placed those things all around the place. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He staged yeah. it so that they could all feel like they... He stacked the lucky dip. It's like Sovereign Hill, how they like spray gold dust into the, the panning <laughs> places so that you can find something and be like, I'm a real gold rush person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but he's about to pull the trigger, so to speak, on the um, on the end of the plan when they hear a noise. And the others are not sure what the noise is, but he's sure it's a sewer cover. And someone's coming to the sewers, but they don't respond to the Tosh's whistle. So he's like, okay, we can't go ahead with the plan. We'll have to come back later and do it. It's like, everybody get out of the sewers, off you go. Um, and he goes back to see what's going on. And he hides in the sewer. And he's like, no, I'm Dodger, I'm safe. And this guy sneaks, comes past him with a, a stiletto and there's a great line where it says uh, no decent murderer would use a, something like that uh, it must be the assassin this must be the outlander this guy with a stiletto and he leaps out of the shadows and pins this guy to the ground gets rid of his knife he's like ah, oh, I'm going to deal with you um, 
And he'd previously heard all these rumors about nobody was sure what the Outlander looked like. He always looked different, but he always had a woman on his arm. And then this woman steps out of the shadows and she's the Outlander. And it was so, oh, I love that bit. What did we feel about that reveal? I didn't see it coming um, because I think I had put too many eggs in the basket of someone we know already being the Outlander. Yeah. Well, I thought that was the clue because they kept saying that nobody thought he looked the same twice. I was like, well, he's yeah. a master of disguise. He's going to turn out to be someone we've met. Um, and then, no, the, the whole disguise was that you thought he was a master of disguise, but actually it was the woman with him, with him in inverted commas, all the time. It's true. I was sifting all the characters trying to work out who the Outlander would, would be. So I, I felt slightly cheated. But then again, I thought it was a, a good twist in, in that she would seem probably the most hapless figure had we have met her because she was a very slight woman. And mm-hmm. um, But I, that, that section where you know, he described the noise and the looming figures is, was my favourite section of the writing. The, 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 the plot was in, in full throttle. Yeah. Uh, the, the atmosphere... Of the uh, of the sewers was was just brilliant, and um, yeah. it and you really had there was the, the mystery of the figure, and then the mystery of the uh, of of the Outlander. All that just you know came together in a, a really satisfying piece of uh, you know piece of plotting and writing. The pacing's really good here mm. too, it and it, it's something we've criticised some of the early Discworld books for is that mm. the the pacing's really off at the end. They always seem to end rather abruptly. Um, several of the earlier ones, whereas this felt really satisfying yeah i've got a sentence here and i know you know i might be jumping the gun but uh, the fact that the (laughs) rats were pouring ahead of the figure that's a really lovely detail um and uh so it's almost like the opposite of the pied piper of hamlin you know the rats were kind of you know being pursued and then there suddenly barely visible in the grimy light was the intruder crawling with commendable stealth love that commendable along the sewer actually passing dodger in his stinking hideaway since dodger was clearly invisible being the same color and certainly the same stink as the sewer itself the rats were running over the intruder too but he was hitting out of them with something Dodger couldn't quite see what, and the rats were screeching, and most certainly the lady, that is the lady of the sewers, would be listening. It was yeah. a great, uh, mm. great scene. Oh yeah, and that's that's the the fake Outlander. That's the mm. that's the bloke, and then the, yeah. the real one shows herself. That's right. And he's basically she's got a gun, so there's nothing he can do really. Like she's got him banged to rights, mm-hmm. um, and she wants to know where her friend, who is, his little friend, is because yeah. he's going to take care of her as well. When all of a sudden, someone smashes her in the head. And it's Simplicity Yay. who saves the day. <laughs> and I thought, this is great. What Maiden's a great rock. way to do yeah. that. Like, just and, and on her own initiative, like he hadn't stashed her away. He hadn't specifically said to her, no, you mustn't come back here. He's just like, everyone get out of the sewers. And she was just like, well, I want to make sure you're all right. And you weren't. <laughs> so I saved you. And it was, oh, it was so satisfying. So satisfying. Yeah, it was. It was a good touch. Um, and that's, that's where it became believable, I think, for me, that she wasn't using him. They were actually mm-hmm. properly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because and and it just it was it was really nice that you know he saves her at the start of the book and then she saves him at the end of the book, which I yeah just nice nice thing that happens symmetry there. yeah, mm. um, and from then on it's kind of just sorting out the details. I mean, uh, and I, I did like that part of the plan was that the other characters would know who Simplicity was, even though she was supposed to be in disguise, and that that would be the payoff where they would go off into the sewers. And then she would accidentally get killed in the sewers. And so the report would go back to the masters of who were the people chasing her that she'd been killed. But now they have to modify the plan and um, he sends her off to hide somewhere um, and he takes the the real Outlander's gun and shoots the corpse of this poor young woman who's already mm, dead. Who'd be um, a fan of the Thames. And, um, and makes sure to mess up her face uh, and puts Simplicity's you know, wedding ring on it. Um, and, you know, the Disraeli and Basil Gett and Dickens come back and one of them, like, really puts their... Disraeli puts his mouth foot in it by really going, are you sure that's really her? And everyone's, like, <laughs> kicking him, going, shut up, shut up, you're supposed to be a witness. <laughs> yeah, I, I was with Benjamin on that one, thinking, yeah, like, how easily would it be to buy? But if you've got, like, 
you know, let's what are we talking about here? This is this is the fun of the book. Yeah. But you've got the Prime Minister and the great arc, you know, sort of chronicler of the day, all insisting that this was simplicity. He lies there. Yeah. Then that's all you need. No, mm. no need for coroners or autopsies. We'll buy it. We'll bury it with dignity and move on. And quite clearly, like I think the prince, the unnamed unknown prince, uh, yeah. is probably quite keen for the whole affair to be over as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. True. Perhaps he's perhaps he's from Bohemia. <laughs> just, to, just to throw a Sherlock Holmes reference in at the last minute mm. um, But then, yeah, we, we sort of come to the end of the plot This this unnamed woman is buried under Simplicity's name um, Simplicity takes on a new name She <laughs> does, great, a great yeah. uh, name she takes on uh, you, you could tell yeah. them what it is Oh, there. serendipity it's How <laughs> cool is that? She sounds like a Bond girl, doesn't she? I mean, to me it got a bit sort of the end of the Lord of the Rings movies Where it kept ending and then another bit would start And then it'd end <laughs> yeah. and then another bit would start But I don't begrudge any of it because it was all good stuff hmm. Especially yeah. um, meeting was it Queen Victoria and Prince Albert We're jumping to get too far forward No, no, that's fine I mean, he does get He gets a Because a, um, he's done a great service Because not only has he Avoided a diplomatic incident, but also and and at the same time saved the life of a young woman. But also, when he went into the embassy and stole a bunch of papers, he did a big favour for the British government because they've got all this dirt on these other people, and um, they returned some information about British subjects. Although Solomon keeps a little bit of something about the royal family for himself, just in case he ever needs a bit of leverage later on. Uh, and so, yeah, he gets gets knighted, which I wasn't expecting. I thought that was a bit that was maybe a bit much. And goodbye, Pipstick. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, now he's Jack, Sir Jack Dodger, <laughs> uh, who not only not only that he's offered a job in the Secret Service, which, given all his skills, I was like, well, you basically are James Bond. I mean, you sneak into much. places and fight people, and yeah, he's pretty great. I, you know, and look, I say this with a with a degree of sadness that um, I sense that there was um, uh, a sequel in mind because it mm. felt like a wonderful place to leave the next book um, of this. Chancer and and mm. a great um, strategist floating around in in France with his new equally uh, skilled uh, bride, like yeah. Tommy and Tuppence from the Agatha Christie books. Yeah, uh, yeah. not to be sadly, but uh, it it did have that feeling of this could well catapult into something new. Mm. That would have that would be cool though to see them working together as spies. Yeah, they'd be amazing. Yeah, they would. Because there's that bit where they go off into the countryside to wait while the heat goes down, yeah. make sure everything's okay before they come back. And she dyes her hair red and changes her name, and, and they drink the lion's piss side. And you, just, <laughs> and you just get that really nice feeling that oh, this is where they're now got they've got the room to figure this out. And because there's that bit earlier where he like says you know we could st- we could go away together after this plan works, and she's like into it but he gets nervous all of a sudden he's oh we don't have to stay together though if you don't want to it's all right and she's like you should learn when to shut up mate and i was like i've had that conversation <laughs> um that's that's great uh you I, had me at hello <laughs> uh, i reckon yeah and in fact i like that so uh, those sort of somerset scenes because it was um it they're kind of the scenes that books don't usually show you it's mm. usually the sunset um you know dwindling over the horizon but this was them getting to know each other us seeing them as a couple mm. and then, you know, there was this, the whole knighthood uh, twist as well. But it was, it actually had quite a, um, there was a felicitous and joyous feeling and, and going with Liz's idea about the whole notion of this is a book about redeeming yourself through losing your filth. You know, yeah. It was as clean and as bucolic as you've ever come. They were in Arcadia, you know, rolling around <laughs> mm. in these sort of summer blazed meadows yeah, it was yeah. really it was really yeah. nice. I, was, I liked it. It was, it was very touching. What what are people's favourite bits or or uh, overall impressions? We didn't talk about Cloacina. Oh yeah. So they talk a lot about the Lady of the Sewers, just usually referred to as the Lady, which is interesting because there's also another goddess in the Discworld books referred to as the Lady, who's usually fate or destiny, and you're not allowed to say her name because it's bad luck. Mm-hmm. But in here is the Lady of the Sewers, and then yeah, we do find out about Cloacina. Do you want to tell us about that? No, I didn't know. Um, you had something to say earlier about it, and I was just like, oh, it's it's interesting word because it's like cloaca. Yeah, but... which takes us back to sphincter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, that, that's, that's for real though Because the Romans had gods for everything They did And I, in fact, when I heard about Cloacina um, Part of me thought Oh, I wish there was a little more of that Because that's a really lovely piece of wordplay mm. And it also brings the mythology You know, the richness of mythology To the, um, 
the real mm. and gives and kind of transcends it, uh, which we only got that in glimpses. And I'm sure that there's a lot more of that in in other of Pratchett's books. But it's a lovely piece of um, just double dealing. It, it, there's wordplay and there's also presenting with you two realities: the you know reality of Richard the Third kind hmm. of infested stink water, yeah. but also this temple idea of London. Um, and in fact, that's my one of my favourite uh, lines oh, is yeah. when that? it uh, describes um, the light of London. It was just only two lines, but it was just really beautiful. Finally, as the golden light of evening made London look more like a pagan temple, all bronze and shiny, and turned the Thames into a second Ganges, they went home, totally ignoring the Punch and Judy man. It's a lovely contrast to how the book starts with those, you know, that semicolon infested filth channel Mm -hmm. that the Thames is, and suddenly it's a second Ganges. So the idea of how the plot has elevated London and made it a, a place that is pure and holy was you know, it's just a beautiful piece of writing and a nice overarching uh, theme that was resonated. And the call back to the realisation about Punch and Judy as well. Yeah, which I quite it was. Liked. They're that like, was we too. we're not interested in that yeah. anymore. Mm. Yeah. What about you, Liz? Did you have any favourite passages or, or puns? So there's a pun that I quite liked when he was talking about choosing between Bedlam and the gallows and... It's quite, yeah, is sort of saying how hanging is better because especially since they're again the art of putting the knot in the rope in such a way that the neck was broken instantly, which saved a lot of hanging around for all concerned, <laughs> oh. uh, which is oh, quite dark. But the thing that I, that it's not a pun, but I enjoyed when they're talking about what to do with the money that he's been given. So Solomon says, I think and therefore I suggest that you put the money with them where it will be safe and earn interest, a very good nest egg indeed. Interest? What's money interested in? More money, said Solomon. Ah, that's lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah. was nice. It's all... true. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's what interest is. It's the interest in making more of itself. There's a great bit from the carriage chase and they're trying to figure out what's going on, like why the horses have stopped. Someone must have stuck part of his umbrella up a horse's nose, causing what previous centuries would have called a hey ho rumbolo, but what the growler captain called it could not have been put on paper because it would have immediately caught fire. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was great. And it's just a nice bit of him putting a bit of even older language in. Um, and there's a callback to that later where someone does something to Dodger and, and nearly causes him a, um, a hey-ho rumbolo. Uh, and I thought, oh, what a great term. I really enjoyed that. This is uh, Sir Robert Peel saying, Mr. Dodger, have you heard the phrase, you are so sharp that you might cut yourself? <laughs> um, and sharp was a really important notion uh, in slang. You know, if you were ahead of the pack, you could out... Uh, think anybody then you were a sharp and uh, uh, the person who could play the dice was called a dicing sharp uh, sharps were also called hawks and needles and, and knickers this that is knickers with an n we have the idea of you know sharpies and spivs but sharp was the original street cred mm. if you were sharp then you could outmaneuver outplay think ahead and I'd love the fact that um, Dodger, coming from the chief of police, was so sharp he might cut himself. That's the expression. And I love that yeah. idea that you can be undone by your own sharpness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's and what makes you a geezer as well. And we still have card sharp, of course. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. Um, it yeah. still yeah, survives. Oh, and another one, actually, and this is from the scene where um, he's meeting Disraeli at the party. He describes someone as having a smile like the morning sun with a knife in its teeth. There's a couple of interesting callbacks to Discworld stuff that I found in in some of the notes. And this is where I might mention that there is a companion book to Dodger called Dodger's Guide to London, which I've uh, mentioned a couple of times. Basically, it's a very horrible history style Mm. compendium of information about Victorian London, including uh, a couple of glossaries. There's a slang glossary at the start. There's another further glossary about criminal terms. I was trying to look up what mumping was, which was an unfamiliar term to me. Uh, which is like scrounging or begging. One of the things that I found that was in the, um, I think it's the Oxford Dictionary, one of the main cited usages of the term was from a Terry Pratchett novel <laughs> when it's used in Nightwatch. Well, it's very Stephen King. Yeah, it is. Uh, but that that is in the context of uh, policemen getting a bit of something free uh, because they're out on patrol, like a like a free mug of beer or a, or a meal. And the other one that comes from, yeah. from the book, uh, in the city of Ankh-Morpork, there's... 
uh, a, uh, a tavern where all of the action always happens, where the heroes wait to get their quests and everything, which is uh, initially called the uh, the Broken Drum and then gets renamed the Mended Drum. And I always thought that was just a gag. Um, and in fact, it's mentioned in one of Pratchett's earlier books before the Discworld that the reason you'd call a pub a Broken Drum is because it can't be beaten. Um, <laughs> but... In here, in the criminal vocabulary of Victorian London, and this is from The Seven Curses of London by James Greenwood, published in 1869, a term for to commit a burglary is to break a drum. Hmm. I'm like, is that where it comes it from, maybe? Well. So I thought that was quite fascinating. Hmm. But that, So those are a couple of little insights. But I do recommend Dodger's Guide to London. There's lots of great little bits and bobs of information in there if you're ever interested in any of it. And there's a fantastic bibliography in the back um, of sources from the time um, and written a little bit afterwards, uh, as well as a whole bunch of websites. Uh, and it's so many illustrations either by uh, Paul Kidby, who does the illustrations for the book and for a lot of other Terry Pratchett, or contemporary illustrations from Punch magazine, um, from postcards, from all kinds of things. It's, uh, it's a fascinating It does look great. Read. I'll have to get that. Yeah, it's great. So which ones did you have? You mentioned you had some good slang. Yeah, just criminal slang. There was a, a blue pigeon was someone who would steal slates from roofs. Anything was, if, if it was, you could remove it, then you would uh, take it. Uh, deaconing, uh, to deacon, and it was very much a practice in, in the kind of cockney fruit markets, is to put the good fruit on top of, a, um, uh, of the pile. And when someone comes to buy six apples, you will deliberately throw in the, the bad apples. That's called deaconing. Probably because you'd have the very you know beautiful cap sitting on top of the um, the pile. Uh, we had river rats who would people who would fleece corpses uh, that were floating down uh, the Thames. And then when it comes to the word phony, um, when something is, is fake, comes from fawny, which was a uh, in Gaelic a brass ring, and it was the brass ring that they would convince the mark, the patsy. Uh, that it was gold. So if you were buying the phony, the the, the brass ring as gold, then you were um, you were being suckered. And often the person who would help a um, <laughs> this is lovely, pick because pickpocketing was so common in those uh, that era, Victorian era, there would often be someone who would help the pickpocket um, operate, and that person would be either called a sneeze lurker, so <laughs> bump or distract the person who's about to be fleeced, wow. or a vamper, which was also very cool. Great word. Hmm? Um, vamper, that's yeah. great. Is that, and, where the, is that where vamping comes from, when someone just talks or ad-libs? Well, vamping actually has... It's got Because vamping is also... That's right, improv jazz, and vamp hmm. can be the top of a shoe, and vamp is you know a minx. It's got, it's got about five different meanings. I'm not quite sure of vamp in that context... But one, my, my favourite uh, would have to be a person who presents as having a lot of land elsewhere outside the city but is a complete con artist is called a sky farmer. <laughs> uh, that's that, great. That was full of scams and full of sharps. Mm. Oh, now I want to be a sky farmer. <laughs> yeah, sky now farmer. That's, a, that's got fantasy novel written yeah, all over it. it? Yeah. It's a whole series there. Oh, wow. Oh, thank you so much, David, for coming along and elucidating us with some of these oh, no, words. Thanks, thanks for introducing me to Terry Pratchett. Um, now, I don't think we got any listener questions. No, we got some great we? observations and some anecdotes, but not really questions. Uh, and we enjoyed all of those observations. Um, so if you've got any more, we'd love to hear from you. Do use the hashtag on social media, PrattChat6, if you'd like to give us any feedback about this episode or tell us what you thought of Dodger. We'd love to hear that. And um, we hope lots of you have read it because we, I think, I think we can safely say we all loved it. I, I really love this book. I enjoyed the doors that it has opened for me. Maybe I didn't love aspects of it, but I'm also thrilled that I have met Pratchett after all these years. I am certainly intrigued to read uh, Discworld because that sounds like a whole different mm. world mm. in so many ways. And also the language. Um, just been thrilled to discover so much of this antiquity that um, informs and pervades our own language. It's very cool. So, yeah, yeah, it's a thumbs up from me with the caveat of just get past... <laughs> The reality, David, enjoy the caper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oddly, I think I don't know that you'll have the same problem in an actual fantasy novel. Yeah. Where, you know, there's magic and stuff. Yeah, that's all right. Look, I, when wands appear, I, I tend to have to swallow hard and just and be brave. <laughs> <laughs> Why do wands suddenly appear? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, it's worth saying before we go that uh, we're doing the next couple of Discworld books, but we're doing them a little bit out of order. So our next episode will be about Eric, 
uh, the book Eric, that is, not a person named Eric. Uh, with not cartoon- Faust. Not yeah. Faust, no. Uh, with uh, cartoonist Georgina George Rex Chatterton. Uh, you can use the hashtag PrattChat7 if you would like to ask us questions about Eric and get your questions in nice and early. We were actually recording the next episode just after this goes to air, so we will be letting you know that date on social media. We will have by the time you listen to this, most likely. Um, but do get your questions in, as always, as soon as possible if you'd like them to be answered on air, as it were. David, thank you so much for Pleasure. coming along. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Liz. Um, would you like to mention any of your books that you've got coming out soon? Yeah, I've got Rewording the Brain, which is out uh, later in 2017 mm-hmm. and 2018, I should say. Get with it, David. <laughs> uh, Rewording the Brain, which I need to do. That's a book about uh, cognitive health and puzzles and how the two interconnect. Oh, that's and fascinating. A kid's book as well, which is called 101 Weird Words and Three Fakes. Oh, three. So you, what did you refer to those words as earlier when they put them in the dictionary? The phone, for oh, the mount weasels. Is yeah. That, is that what they are? Yeah, they're mount weasels. Yeah, that's oh, right. Little trap words. Amazing. Now, and people can hear you not just on our podcast, but you're appearing on ABC Radio more often these days, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, look, just regular bench player, which has been a lot of fun and um, filling in where we're required as a locum broadcaster <laughs> and doing what we're doing here, just kind of pushing buttons and enjoying the chat. It's a, a lot of fun. You're running this dinner party and a whole lot of interesting people are just dropping by for chats. and oh, Just like yeah. in Dodger. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the on-air Dodger. <laughs> yeah. So keep an ear out for David on ABC Melbourne and other ABC networks. Um, and thank you, as always, for joining us. And thank you, too, to those people who've been uh, giving us reviews on iTunes. That's very kind. It really does help people find the podcast. So if you are listening via iTunes uh, and you have a moment to give us a, a rating or a review, that would be very much appreciated. Um, and otherwise, if you spread the word in any way, we're very, very grateful. We've had a lot of nice people coming along to listen to the podcast. Not in person. That would be weird. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening. And we'll see you next time on Pratchett um, as long as we you know dodge any difficulties in between now and then you've been listening to Pratchett the monthly Terry Pratchett book club podcast with Pratchatters Elizabeth Flux Ben McKenzie that's me and guest David Astle Pratchett is produced and edited by me with music by David Ashton of Sample and Hold Studios we'd love to hear from you you can find us on Twitter Instagram and Facebook at the Pratchett Podcast or on the web at pratchettpodcast.com Join the conversation for this episode using the hashtag PrattChat6. PrattChat is brought to you by Splendid Chaps Productions. We make entertainment for your ears, like the Doctor Who podcast Splendid Chaps and time travel comedy series Night Terrace. To find out more, visit SplendidChaps.com.